Um, I know it's challenging. And so I really appreciate all of the efforts of all the different people involved. Um, so my name is Jay Herbert. I work at Vermont Compost Company. Um, I've worked there for over a decade now. And in my time, I've had multiple roles um, as both a compost producer, potting soil producer, but also as someone performing research and development tasks, um, specifically around, um, you know, efficacy of, of um, you know, safe potting media production. Um, and so in that time frame, I've, I've seen a lot of different challenges that have come down the pike. And it does seem like in the last 10 years, there have been quite a few of them. It seems like as the years go by, more and more challenges tend to pop up. And that's something that, you know, um, for us as a company and for us as an industry is difficult. We essentially acquire and consolidate feedstocks. We make them into compost and potting media. And we, then we disseminate those products. In that process, we are concentrating nutrients. And that means that we are potentially concentrating contaminants as well. So we, we take our job very seriously. We understand that, that, that what we are doing has the potential to sustain and further organic agriculture as we know it. Um, but it also has the potential to cause a lot of harm to a lot of different farmers, gardeners, um, in use consumers, etc. And so we try to stay as you know, far abreast as we can on the research, on the current understandings around some of these challenges. And that's what inspired me to give this talk. It's not, it's not something that is necessarily pleasant. I know that it it there's there's a lot of there's a lot of there's a lot of hope in gathering with um with other farmers, with other gardeners and discussing seed saving, you know, discussing um different tillage techniques. You know, there's there's, there's, this is sort of the shadow side of it. And it's something that um, I, I, it's, it's not necessarily easy to talk about because some of the information is distressing. The picture in some ways is not pretty, but it's the world that we've created. And ultimately it's really important that we get comfortable with the subject matter and that we discuss it realistically so that we understand um, what is out of our hands, and then what controls we do have, and we can actually implement um, in an actionable way to protect our resources, specifically the resource of organic matter um, as it exists as a product of a composting process. So one of the things, um, one of the challenges right now that's facing a lot of different organic waste recyclers, composters, um, is that is that bioremediation itself is is its own its own art form its own craft and a lot of what composters are trying to do right now is they're trying to generate a resource and to do that profitably and so a company like ours is very fortunate in that we are essentially able to take something like compost and value at it that is to convert it into a potting media and ultimately to build a business model around that. There are, there, there's a great need for remediation of organic waste, for recycling of organic waste. And as such, there are a lot of, uh, you know, compost companies, municipalities, et cetera, that exist and their mission statement is to, to eliminate, you know, let's say, you know, food residuals from entering the, um, the solid waste stream, right? And that's a, that's that's a wonderful thing, and that's a very important mission. But that means that they are dependent on tipping fees, for instance, um, you know, money paid by haulers to bring residuals to the composting company. They're they're dependent on those tipping fees in order to survive as a business. And that means that they're forced to accept, you know, um, you know, they're forced to accept certain residuals that that maybe are far from perfect or that contain contaminants. Um, and that means that they are at risk of creating a product that, as I said, disseminates toxins. Um, and that, so that's, that's, that's a challenge in the industry is, you know, when you actually look at the economics of it, the profitability 
of generating this resource and doing it safely. Um, as the company, Vermont Compost can afford to be pretty selective. We're also very fortunate in that our business exists on the edge of a rural urban interface. And so we're able to bring in all kinds of residuals from local farms, i.e. manures, spoiled haylage, silage, things like that. We're able to have personalized relationships with those farms, which means that we know roughly what they're putting into their fields. And so we know, you know, we know whether or not we can afford to receive residuals from them. And at the same time, we're located on the periphery of the city of Montpelier, which more accurately should be called a town. And that means that we have access to um, a food stream there. At the same time, we're not we're not absolutely inundated with food, you know, in the way that a company that would be, you know, located outside of a large urban area may be. And that, of course, puts us at the advantage that, again, we can afford to be selective. Um, and it means that at our scale, there's a lot more that we can do to mitigate potential concerns, for instance, plastic contamination. If we were a significantly larger company, we would be working with significantly more material, which would mean that we have to change the way that we handle it to function at scale. And as such, we would lose some of our ability to um, to, to, to really mitigate some of these problems. Um, and that's not to say that that's not to say that it is hopeless or that or that you know scaling up is a bad thing or that it can't be done in today's world. It is to say, and I would hope that this talk is a little bit of a clarion call, that the more that we can do to create small scale, community scale composting systems, the more likely we are to be able to have local control over some of these organic residual streams, the more likely we are to cultivate relationships with the farms, with the businesses, with the uh, the end use consumers creating this waste, and ultimately to begin to hopefully locally educate people about the dangers inherent in, you know, everything from, uh, you know, food packaging to certain pesticides and herbicides that are used in agriculture, so that their use can be restricted through personal choice, through communication and through understanding of the dangers. And in that way, I think that is our best hope for, for changing some of these dynamics. It's going to be, you know, we're dealing with, with a problem that is ubiquitous. And we have like an umbrella of problems here coming from living in an industrialized society um, that relies on, you know, large scale production of all kinds of consumer goods. And in so doing, inundates the environment with toxins. But it's, a, it's, it's going to be a grassroots effort to deal with these on a local level, which again is going to come down to education and communication. And that's simply more likely and more possible when you have um, when you have small scale composters, small scale haulers, small scale producers working with local populations. So we will get into that. But um, one of the things that 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 has always been the case is that in the modern world, um, so I'll be speaking, I'll be speaking from the perspective of a composter. That's what I know best. And so I'm I'm going to speak to that primarily. Um, but in the modern world, composters have always had to deal with contamination to some extent. When you go back into you know, the history of the art, it stretches all the way back to ancient Greece and probably and possibly before. But as it was elucidated by Sir Albert Howard in the early 1900s, um, when he came back from research farms in, in Indoor India and talked about what they called the indoor method of compost, which was essentially, you know, um, uh, you know, air, aerobic decomposition of organic materials, um, he was describing a process that was taking place um, on you know, in villages, on tea plantations in India. And this was being done as a relatively closed loop, if you will, in that, in that animal dungs and discarded tea leaves, food residuals, things like that, were being composted properly and were being turned back into, you know, um, a nutrient-rich 
organic material that could then be applied to local gardens as well as to these tea plantations. And this 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 method is, you know, the still the basis of what we do today as far as, you know, um, aerobic decomposition. But again, we're doing it at scale now. And we're doing it in a way that we're we're trying to maintain clean feedstock sourcing. So our feedstocks are our compost constituents, um, whether that's manure, food residuals, or more carbonaceous materials like spent hay, straw, leaf mulch, things like that, um, sometimes paper products. And so we're trying to maintain clean feedstock sourcing, but at scale, as these as as companies like ours and um, you know municipal compost facilities get larger, a lot of these feedstocks are coming from a wider radius. And that means that as they come in from you know further and further afield, there's there's less and less control over inputs and inputs are everything when it comes to um feedstock selection there's a lot of things that we can we can talk about you know persistent herbicides is one of the things that we're going to talk about and i think first um that you know there are a number of different um auxin based herbicides that are used to treat um grains cereal crops um, and hay fields, pastures that are persistent herbicides. They're metabolically persistent, meaning that they will survive. Um, they will survive in you know monogastric and ruminant animals' guts. So passing through horses, passing through cow, sheep, goats, etc. And they also can survive through some or all composting processes. And of course, if you've imported from you know a long ways away, a bunch of you know you know, animal bedding basically, or animal pack. So like, let's say pack from a cow barn, from a heifer barn. And that was that hay had at some point been treated with a persistent herbicide, an auxin based herbicide, then it is, it is very possible that those chemicals will persist through the composting process. And then when they are ultimately matured and then delivered to um, a gardener or a farmer, they can produce damage on that end. And that's something that it becomes harder and harder again to have those relationships with those producers when we um, when we go further afield for these ingredients. So, so you know, so kind of going, so kind of working backwards. Um, one of the things that 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 I want to that I I want to touch on is microbial diversity is extremely important. One of the things that we're finding is that a lot of the hope and a lot of the potential in remediation of some of these contaminants comes from diversity in the compost itself. Well-made compost is inherently diverse, um, but of course there are, there are certain things that can be done to ensure that. One of those is feedstock selection. The way that, that that life on earth has evolved is, um, is, is, is towards greater and greater diversity. Some of the, the big extinction events, events of the past, and I'm talking way back, I'm talking, you know, over three and a half billion years ago, the initial extinction events on planet earth had to do with the proliferation of certain fermenting bacteria that were able to work with simple sugars, um, and we're and we're able to create you know high levels of of carbon dioxide in doing so that then set the stage for the rise of cyanobacteria and related you know what we call now blue green algae um, which are actually photosynthes photosynthesizing sorry bacteria that were able to use carbon dioxide and were able to respire oxygen when this happened and this is we're talking again about three and a half billion years ago. Um, when this happened, this um this sudden this sudden inundation of oxygen changed the dynamics on planet Earth um, to a great degree. And we saw basically an extinction level event where there were a number of different species that we don't we don't even, you know, of course we can't begin to catalog them now that were lost. Um, since that time, you know, Earth has the biosphere on earth has always shifted and it's always shifted in favor of um greater and greater diversity as 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 
as you know, complex compounds increased, so did the life forms that could utilize them. Those life forms would then would then generate even more complex compounds. And so on and on and on and on and on. And suddenly, you know, the 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 trophic chain, the food chain, if you will, got wider and wider and wider and extended into plants, into fungi, into animals, all of the different kingdoms that we know and love today. As such, we've moved in the direction of this diversity. One of the issues with industrial toxicity is that is that it creates a large volume of waste that is very high in certain um, toxic compounds. And so what's happening is we're, we're moving in the other direction in that we're creating now concentrations of certain compounds. And ultimately, in, in the long run, um, and, and this may not seem relevant to us in our discussion today, in the long run, personally, I have hope that life on planet Earth as we know it will be capable, is capable of digesting a lot of these compounds and even thriving on them. I remember anecdotally at one point reading, and, and I'm sorry, I don't have the documentation in front of me, but I remember anecdotally reading about researchers in uh, Ukraine that had found in, in the decommissioned Chernobyl reactors had found certain species of fungi that had actually mutated to become radiotrophic. They were actually living off of radioactive isotopes. Um, and so, you know, to me, there is, there is, there is, there is hope for life on planet earth. As far as human beings go and the societies that we've created, whether we recognize it or not, we are dependent on that greater diversity. And so creating these concentrations of particularly toxic compounds, but as we'll see, you know, even heavy metals, heavy metals and trace elements are part of the periodic table. They're an important part of life. They're an important part of plant and animal nutrition. But when you have high concentrations of them, of course, they become toxic. Um, we don't, we're dependent on this diversity. And yet what we are doing in industrialized society is anathema to that self-same diversity. And so um, one of the things that we need to do, and I'll go through this as we talk about these different threats and we get more practical in this discussion, one of the things that we need to do is we need to make sure that, that we are creating complex organic matter that is made from diverse sources, but also promotes, again, sorry to be redundant, but a diverse microbiology. Um, in a lot of ways, that is, that is um, in our industry, the best option that we have to deal with some of these contaminants. And the same goes for farmers and fields. Um, people can get into a difficult position just as a composter can get in trouble when they're relying on tipping fees solely um, to sustain a business model. Farmers who are not focused on soil health or who are, pri who are, who are focused on it secondarily, um, may find that the biodiversity of their their soil, their tilth, decreases. And when that happens, the ability of certain bacteria and fungi to complex organic contaminants drops significantly. And that's when you begin to see these concentrations of, you know, plant available heavy metals. That's when you begin to see, you know, high levels of, um, you know, perfluoral um, alkyl substances, PFAs and PFA-like compounds. Um, that's where we're seeing plastics that are that are you know building up in concentration in farm soils. So so what I'm promoting is I'm promoting um, you know real real knowledge and education um, around microbial diversity because it is that microbial diversity that has the best chance to um, to to alter the course of this arc of contamination in composts and in field soils. Um, and so one of the things that I want to touch on now, if you can give me just one second, please. Um, I'm hoping to kind of talk about the bigger picture. And so I, you know, I want to touch on that, but I also do want to present some practical methods uh, to help us exclude contaminants and or remediate them. And I also want to encourage people, you know, farmers and gardeners who are not making their own compost, but are sourcing it and purchasing it, 
to kind of know what it is that they need to look out for in order to protect themselves from some of these problems. And so um, the first thing would be to kind of discuss the composting process a little bit. I don't want to go too far into it. Um, and I don't want to be, you know, patronizing. I, I, I want to I want to assume that everybody has a decent working knowledge, but I'm going to touch on it some because it's kind of important that we have a basic understanding of what actually happens in a compost pile from its inception when feedstocks are mixed together and it begins to decompose all the way to the time that it lands in the bed of a pickup truck to go to a field or, you know, in a dump truck to be brought to a field um, or in our instance is made into a potting media. And so Compost is essentially a three-stage process, and the, the first stage is, um, is, is a mesophilic stage, so it's, so it's a cool stage in which psychrophilic bacteria proliferate. These are bacteria that can survive at some pretty cold temperatures. These are not, these are, you know, these temperatures are not extremely cold, um, but you're talking about, you know, temperatures basically below usually 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And a lot of these bacteria and fungi, um, the fungi especially secrete organic acids, but both of these will do work to actually begin fermenting some of the proteins that are found um, in these initial feedstocks. And in doing so, some of these, some of these, some of these fermentation products actually protect these proteins and help to make them available for later stages. What happens is as these numbers build up, these proteins are consumed. As the proteins are consumed, the temperature does begin to go up as the bacteria especially reproduce. A bacterium, your average bacterium will reproduce roughly every 20 minutes or so. And so you can have a single bacterium that, you know, by the end of the day can have turned into a million very easily. Um, so temperature in compost piles, when, when, when the feedstocks are mixed properly, the temperature can rise very, very rapidly. And at a certain point, the, um, the psychrophilic bacteria and fungi go dormant. They, they convert into endospores or they insist. They, they basically go into a dormant form that will protect them. Um, they're not able to utilize any of, the, uh, any of the available nutrients at the temperatures that then begin to favor a whole nother suite of primarily but not entirely bacteria. And this is the thermophilic stage. When most people think of compost, they think of, you know, especially this time of year when it's cold outside, they think of a pile that's, you know, open and that's steaming. Um, a lot of people know that at about 131 degrees Fahrenheit, um, compost begins to not sterilize, but at that temperature, it begins to eliminate a lot of pathogenic organisms, um, whether those are human pathogens like E. coli and, um, and shigella and things like that, there's, there, there are also a number of plant pathogens that cannot survive at those temperatures and that either are eliminated outright or they go dormant. Um, as the compost runs at this temperature, bacteria begin to work on hemicellulose and cellulose, which are you know two of the simpler compounds that make up woody debris. And so they begin to break these down, they generate more heat, Primarily at this point, one of the largest um, genera of bacteria that's active are the um, are the bacillus species, and they generate more heat. When the temperature goes very high, there's another genus that becomes that becomes more active, and those are thermus, which are initially those were species that lived in deep sea vents or would live in you know geysers. Um, and we're able to survive at extremely high temperatures. They become active when temperatures go above about 150 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, during this period, the bacteria, which have a really low C to N ratio, meaning that they have a lot more nitrogen than they do carbon, they digest this nitrogen very rapidly and they live on simple sugars as well, very simple carbons. But as, as, as their population tapers off, these compounds begin to become more and more complex. So they generate more and more complex carbon compounds, eventually generating ulmic, fulvic, and humic acids. Um, in so doing, they set the stage for the final part of the process, which is the curing process. And at this point, a number of species of fungi in a well-made compost pile will, will proliferate. And this is very, very, very important because there are a number of differences between bacteria and fungi, obviously. But 
but among those are some really key differences and bacteria again you know tend to live on simple sugars or or simple carbon if you will um and large volumes of nitrogen and in fact as they as they you know go through a compost pile and break down they're actually respiring a lot of carbon as co2 they're releasing a lot of co2 um fungi actually tend to sequester carbon they tend to build hyphal sheaths so their actual mycelium is made up of hypha and the hypha are made up of chitin that is largely made up of um what was formerly labile carbon in other words carbon that was constantly changing forms now it becomes locked into this form of a hyphal sheath and so if compost is well made if it has ample curing time if it has the correct feed stocks in the beginning and these fungi are able to proliferate they're able to actually sequester a lot of carbon and this is really important because what fungi also do is they tend to be you know diverse in their enzyme production so a lot of bacteria will tend to produce one or you know two or a few enzymes per bacterium and they tend to target certain compounds so while you have many more species of bacteria active, um, each one is only targeting a few selected compounds. That diversity is important there too, because obviously the more species you have, the more compounds you can complex into organic matter and ultimately break down, the more contaminants you can potentially render harmless. But for fungi, each fungi is able to secrete, in most cases, multiple enzymes, which makes them very active decomposers and very effective decomposers. It also makes them, um, it also makes them very good at sequestering certain industrial contaminants and remediating those contaminants. So one of the things that we'll touch on is is the criticality of making sure that the compost that is being generated, that is being applied, is is very very rich. Has had basically. Um, has had has had a full maturation process so that it's able to incubate as many fungal species beneficial fungal aerobic fungal species as possible um and so it, it's important to note that we're because we're going to talk more about fungi and their role and they're going to come up over and over again as we talk about some of these individual um threats it's it's fungi on average comprise about 75% of, of healthy soil, soil biomass. So in most soils, saprophytic fungi, in other words, decomposer fungi are, are you know, they, they comprise the majority of the biomass of that soil. And in addition to that, there's an estimated, you know, somewhere around one and a half million species of fungi worldwide. Again, this is an estimation, it's an educated guess, um, but what we do know is that of those, we're assuming one and a half million species of fungi, approximately 100,000 of them have been named or cataloged. Um, so that means that, that we, really have, we really have only begun to scratch the surface in terms of our knowledge of the fungal kingdom. And that means that we've definitely only begun to scratch the surface in terms of our knowledge of the potential for this kingdom to have um, remedial value when we talk about industrial toxins. Um, so that's about, you know, let's assume that there are one and a half million different species of fungi, then you're talking about, you know, we've cataloged 6.6% of the total species on planet Earth. Um, that's, that's, you know, that's hardly anything. And I, I mentioned those statistics because as we talk more about fungi and their potential role in this, you know, remedial effort, I I, I want to go back to that 6.6%. I want it to be understood that that the biodiversity of planet Earth is the best way to ensure um, biodiversity, you know, in our actual ag soils, in our compost that we're generating. And fungi are essentially key to that. And that's something that um and that's something that 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 we're going to touch on again and again. So fungi in in terms of their in terms of their 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 remedial potential another thing that's that's unique to them is that they their cell walls are made of chitins and glucans as opposed as opposed to um as opposed to um uh peptidoglycans and bacteria. 
bacteria do not, they, the bacteria secrete some, what we call biosurfactants, which are compounds that allow them to essentially, you know, um, adsorb, you know, certain chemical constituents of rock, for instance, of organic matter, um, and to begin to break these things down. But fungi produce a lot more and their cell walls are much more resistant to um, the corrosive effects of some of these biosurfactants. So fungi are essentially able to thrive in the presence of these. It also means that they are able to, um, to adsorb more compounds and to bring them in, to incorporate them into their cell walls or to digest them outright and convert them in the case of contaminants to render them harmless. Um, fungi also tend to have a higher turgor pressure so that the pressure inside of a hyphal sheath it tends to be much higher um, than than the pressure, the turgor pressure inside of a of of a, of a bacterium. Bacteria tend to run anywhere from about 100 to 300 kilopascals, which is you know that's it's yeah it, it it's it's kind of just a number to throw around. But when you look at it relative to fungi, which tend to have an internal turgor pressure of about 600 kilopascals, that's the same pressure as roughly a bike tire. Um, when it's fully inflated. And that means that fungi are also able, whether it's in the soil, whether it's in compost, they're able to maneuver into all kinds of different nooks and crannies. And that means that they're able to access and work with a lot of different, um, a lot of different materials. Um, bacteria, of course, are, you know, single-celled organisms that lack nuclei, and they reproduce through binary fission. So again, they, a single bacterium will reproduce roughly every 20 minutes. It's very, very rapid, but because they don't actually, you know, a single cell won't, won't, won't proliferate into a larger organism that's capable of growing out and sending different, you know, hyphal sheaths all over the place to sort of, you know, find, acquire, and um, consume nutrients. Bacteria rely on that reproduction. And as such, they tend to, they tend to grow from one one small cell into a large cluster or colony, and as such, they 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 spread outwards. They move the periphery of their colony outwards um, in a way that's that, that isn't the same kind of fractal pattern, if you will, that fungi can follow. So fungi can send tendrils this way, they can send them that way, and when they find food sources that suit their needs, they can then focus their energy at, at a certain hyphal tip that's discovered a food source. They can branch out rapidly there and they can consume that resource and then they can they can so they can move around and form these little little constellations of of hyphae um, through a compost pile or through an ag soil or through a forest soil and they can very effectively find pockets of nutrients or in the case of remediation contaminants and to begin to decompose them um, bacteria have to grow out from one location and then kind of like move wider they are motile so in you know, in an aqueous and a wet environment, they can they can move around somewhat freely. Some species that use you know flagella to move themselves along, but ultimately, when they're when when bacteria are dealing with um, contamination, they're going to deal with it, if you will, from the outside in, because they're going to have to expand as a colony. They're going to have to contact it, and then they're going to have to begin to work their way through it. That doesn't mean that they're not effective, and there's a lot of um, there's a lot of examples of, you know, certain types of bacteria, I think certain types of bacillus that are used to clean up, you know, hydrocarbon oil spills, um, you know, in marine environments, for instance, and they, they, they work very well, they're, they're, they're very skilled at that, but, but the, the, in terms of, in terms of dealing with, you know, unfortunately, a diverse array of contaminants in soils in compost, having the diversity of bacteria and fungi makes it more likely that these different, um, these different, you know, these different enzymes that they utilize, as well as these different modes of reproduction and uh, modes of transport, will enable, the, will, will basically create the greatest possibility of um, remediation of some of these toxins. A lot of, a lot of, you know, bioremediation is is at this point. An established field. It's something that has been happening for decades. Um, you know, we've we've recognized the potential, and especially at the beginning, we recognized the potential of certain bacterial species to again do things to like to break down oil spills, for instance.
Um, and, but there's been a lot of research that's been focused, and to this day, you'll see it's still focused on individual species of bacteria, and now increasingly on individual species of fungi. And one of the one of the issues with this is that when we're, you know, we talked about, you know, um, life on Earth is essentially dependent on diverse conditions, and it's 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 dependent on diverse conditions, but it is also dependent on um it's also dependent on 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 a, a species is dependent on its ability to meet a number of um environmental challenges to survive and so when when we're doing industrial scale remediation work and we're talking about maybe like breaking down plastics with fungi and there is a whole exciting field opening up around this one of the big challenges um, is that if we were to, you know, if we were to um, inoculate landfills with a certain type of fungus that has shown some some very real promise in breaking down different types of plastic, particularly uh, polyurethane, then, you know, on the one hand, this fungus can survive in anaerobic environments, which is a landfill. Um, on the other hand, will it be able to proliferate in this landfill that's also going to be rich in other and other types of contaminants, whether those are hydrocarbon contaminants, you know, you know, PCBs, pyrenes, or um, or heavy metals. And so when we select a single species of fungi or bacteria to do this remediation work, one of the things that we're doing is we're selecting for essentially one trait. And of course, in nature, species don't thrive by focusing on one trait they thrive through a multiplicity of traits and um and and also a multiplicity of species that allows each one to find kind of a niche work it and that that basically keeps the environment from becoming too concentrated with any one nutrient again some of the early mass extinction events on the planet resulted from the proliferation of oxygen into the atmosphere because we had these you know incalculably large blooms of certain fermenting, well, bacteria, but they're technically classified as RK. We'll call them bacteria for now, but because of these large, you know, blooms of bacteria, um, conditions were created where essentially the 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 atmosphere of the planet was fundamentally different at certain levels, and that that meant that the um, and that meant that the uh, and that meant that the um. And that meant that the speciation of the planet, which at that time was primarily bacterial, would suddenly flip. You would have a dominant species or a dominant, you know, series of species that could no longer survive in the conditions and they would change. Um, we've moved further and further towards diversity. And because of that, it's 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 this it's the remedial potential of this diversity that offers the greatest benefit. Um, there are a lot of challenges to trying to do remediation work with single species. A lot of this is being done in laboratories. It's being done in closed environments where a lot of these species are, are able to work unhindered by other environmental challenges. So to do this work in the real world, that is in compost piles and in ag soils, um, we're going to have to do everything that we can to promote species diversity. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about, um, I want to talk a little bit about, sorry, forgive me for a second. I just, I'm, I kind of want to skip over some things. I think I want to get now into some of the clear and present dangers, if you will, uh, that we face as far as, you know, certain challenges. Um, one of the one of the ones that we'll start with, this is not a resolved issue. Um, it's something that that still pops up from time to time. It's still out there, but um, a lot of you are probably familiar with some of the scares that happened, particularly this this really kind of came onto our radar a, roughly ten years ago um, with the introduction of a, a pyrrolid auxin based persistent herbicides onto um, onto the market to be used. The, so, so these are herbicides that they're, they're broadleaf herbicides. They essentially have been, as I mentioned before, I think applied to cereal grains and to 
um, to, to, to pastures, to hay ground in order to eliminate broadleaf weeds. Um, they don't, they don't damage grasses generally. Um, they do target broadleaf weeds. And so because of this, they, they became, you know, kind of commonly used around to the, the early 2000s, around 2010. And around that time, a number of composters nationwide began having issues because these are persistent herbicides. They would survive through a composting process. And so composters were selling compost that people would put on their gardens or they would put on, onto a farm. They would use it to amend their soils. And they would suddenly have plants that were either killed or were suffering from what's known as epinasty, which, you know, um, again, I don't mean to be pedantic, but if some of you know the term, forgive me, but epinasty is, is, is generally um, a cupping of plant tissues. Um, it can be in response to environmental stresses, but in this case, it's a, it's a very particular response to um, exposure to, to um, these auxin-based herbicides. And the three main herbicides are aminopyrrolid, clopyrrolid, and picloran. And um, they're, they're sold un under a number of different um, names. I can go into some of it. I don't know if you guys are going to care to take notes, but there's a number of different names you know, uh, aminopyrrolid and picloram are sold as milestone, chaparral, and open site. Clopyrrolid is sold as clopyr, ag, stinger, transline, curtail, redeem, RMP, and confront. Um, these, especially aminopyrrolid and picloram, they are active as, as, as herbicides on plants at levels as low as one part per billion, which is the equivalent of something like you know, we're talking like a couple drops of water in like an Olympic sized swimming pool, roughly. So, you know, you can imagine that's, that's, that's a very, very, very small amount. These are coming into compost facilities because they're being applied onto these fields that are then harvested for hay or animals are grazed on them. Either way, they make their way into an animal's rumen um, and they're, they're, they're excreted as manure onto bedding. And that is then shipped off to a compost facility where it goes through a composting process. Um, it persisting through that process means that it's then present in the compost that is then sold to the farmer, to the gardener. And so, because luckily I start with this because this is somewhat of an older issue as many of you are aware. Um, when this happened, some of the companies like, like Dow AgroSciences um, once the research was done and it was very, very clear that, that these issues were coming from aminopyrrolid based herbicides that had been applied onto hay ground, for instance, and pasture in the Northeast, they changed their labeling so that aminopyrrolids couldn't actually be sprayed onto these fields. Um, picloram is a restricted use herbicide, so it's not something that we, that we run into as often. Clopyrrolid is one that is still used. And fortunately, I suppose, clopyrrolid, one of the things that we found is that in the composting process, clopyrrolid will show up on the front end. It will persist through the thermophilic phase of composting, which is, tends to be bacterially dominant. But through the curing or the maturation phase, which tends to be fungally dominant, um, clopyrrolids will actually break down and they will actually um, reduce to negligible amounts below that one part per billion so that they may or may not still be in the final product, but they're not causing any harm to plants. They don't tend to bioaccumulate, and then in the soil, they will, over time, break down. They have a fairly long half-life. It can be a year or so, but you know, with application to a healthy soil and either through microbial action in that soil or through tillage, they do break down. So it's not something that will continue indefinitely, but for composters and for you know, farmers, gardeners, purchasing from composters, one of the most important questions to ask, one of the most practical things that can be done are bioassays. So, um, so, so a person either procuring the compost or manufacturing it will want to actually plant sensitive plants, which will be, you know, broadleaf plants, primarily legumes, but unfortunately, all of your garden variety plant families are affected, you know, so your solanaceae, your nightshades, potatoes, tomatoes, um, obviously, like I said, broadleaf plants, so all of your brassicas are susceptible, all your chinopodes, so your, you know, your beets, 
um, your chards, your spinach. And so what, what a lot of composters want to do is they want to plant especially legumes. Um, clovers are especially susceptible, peas, and they want to look for this epinasty, this unusual cupping. Um, and they want to see if they begin to see that in certain batches of compost. Um, what a composter or a farmer, for instance, or a gardener who's making their own compost can do is if they're going to bring in a feedstock and they're unsure of what may have been applied to it. So for instance, you know, um, they're going to bring in, you know, cow manure, which of course is going to contain some amount of bedding and the farmer that's generating this resource is, you know, unsure, let's say of, um, of, of, of where some of the hay that they used in their process may have come from. And therefore it, it potentially could have some exposure to, you know, clopyrrolid um, herbicides. One of the things that a person can do is they can actually make um, a, either a, a, a tea, either using this manure or using some of the hay that would, would have been found in it. And to actually make an infusion to just infuse for, you know, a 24 hours or so, um, to actually put some of the hay or some of the manure into water and then to water their bioassays, their trials with this water. And of course, you know, a manure tea can, can, can cause certain nutrient deficiencies depending on pH, depending on soluble salts and things like that. But um, that actual trait, that epinasty is very, very, very distinctive. It's something that I would encourage you to look up pictures online if you're unsure. And if, if a person is seeing that, after watering with with one of these test teas that they've made, then they can reasonably assume that that feedstock is potentially contaminated with a clopyrrolid based herbicide, and they don't want to use it. Um, this is something that I will say that 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 in this in this region in New England, New York, in this area, most of the compost facilities, especially ones that are selling that that aren't that that are primarily selling to gardeners and farmers rather than let's say urban landscapers are doing bioassays so they are planting legumes um and and they're and and they're and they're checking them to watch their growth and to see if they're actually seeing epinasty traits that would suggest that there is contamination in their feedstocks and they're doing that batch by batch so they're making sure that each batch of compost they generate has been tested in that way they can be reasonably assured that it is that it is clean of clopyrrolids or at least has them at you know at such a low threshold that it's not going to cause any kind of plant response this is something that if you are a farmer and you're 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 searching out sources of compost then you're going to want to ask questions um this is a fair question to ask of a company to ask if they do bioassays specifically looking for um pyrrolid based herbicides and again this is something that um this is something that there, there is hope in that, again, we've seen that the diversity that we find in well-made, well-matured compost, compost that has, you know, that has basically been through, you know, a nine to 12 month um, uh, breakdown period, some of that thermophilic and some of that um, a curing stage that's fungally dominant. Again, these, these, the, these pyrrolid herbicides, at least clopyrrolid, do tend to break down and to almost, or if not outright disappear, which of course suggests that again, species diversity means that there are enough species in there that can, that, that can work on these compounds differentially using enzymes to break them down in one form or another, and they can then be broken down further as time progresses on. It's important to mention that one of the benefits of compost and one of the big hopes and the remedial potential is Yes, it concentrates nutrients and can therefore concentrate toxins. On the other hand, compost is this, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of like a furnace compared to, it's synonymous with like a furnace in comparison with like, a, with like an open campfire, let's say, in the same way that, um, you know, that, 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 that compost is to the furnace as, as, you know, um, a soil is to the campfire. So, the the metabolic phasing that's happening is happening very 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 rapidly so one species is handing off you know certain compounds that they've they've complexed into um into other forms of carbon to other species that are then taking it further and so you know basic you know so basic proteins 
um, are being broken down into constituents and, you know, lignans like that you find in woody debris, hemicellulose and cellulose and plant tissue are being broken down. They're being combined into amino acids into and being assembled into new proteins. They're also being converted into omic, fulvic, and then humic acids. And that process of, um, of, of that process of complexing carbon is what compost essentially does. When it finally arrives at that stage of humic acid, we're talking about compounds that if they are not overly disturbed, meaning you're in a soil that isn't overly tilled, those humic acids have a half-life, some of them, you know, as much as 500 years. So you're talking about carbon complexes that, that can then, the word is complex, can pull in other nutrients and can hold those nutrients, particularly heavy metals, and keep them from being bioavailable. So that while they may exist in the soil, they are, um, they are unavailable to plants and they are also diluted with their inclusion in these complexes of organic matter. Compost does this, as I said, you know, compost is to field soil in the same way that like a furnace is to, um, is to a campfire. It's these, these processes are happening so much more rapidly in the compost pile that when it's well-made, when it's well-maintained, there is, there is a lot of, um, there is a lot of, there is a lot of, um, of, of, of successional digestion that allows for these toxins to be broken down into simpler forms that are innocuous or harmless, or to be complex, to be, to be brought into these, these humic acid molecules and essentially rendered unavailable to plants and therefore rendered unavailable to the remainder of the food chain for a very, very, very long period of time. Um, talking about heavy metals and complexing, the next thing to get into, the, the next challenge that we face are heavy metals and PFAS. Um, we're going to talk about heavy metals first. And the reason that I categorize these two things together, they're not, they're not chemically related. They're not similar. However, they, 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 there are two things. One, they tend to be prevalent in areas that have seen a lot of industrial activity or have had the residuals of industrial activity um, deposited on those areas. And two, they tend to persist in the environment. And we all know this. Um, some of the people that are, that are, that are in this talk right now may have directly been affected by PFA contamination. If that's the case, you know, I'm, I'm sorry. And it's, you know, it's, it's, it's something that, that is an emerging threat. Um, it's been around for a while, but at this point, of course, we're, 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 you know, we're, we're really wrestling with it. We're grappling with it. And when these things emerge, um, they tend to kind of, you know, come in swinging they tend to be very scary and be, because there's a lot that we don't know we're kind of lost in what they would might call the fog of war we're not really sure what the greater impacts are we're not really sure how widely disseminated they actually are we're not really sure you know what you know you know what kind of threat this represents in the long run and and what the implications actually are particularly for um for organic farmers and gardeners Heavy metals are an old issue, of course. Um, before I go further, I should ask, I, I'm just going to query and ask, are there any questions that anybody wants to ask about, you know, pyrolid per, um, herbicides and composting? Is there anything there that anyone would like me to touch on a little further? Can you just tell us how to spell epinasty? Mm -hmm. Yep. So it's E P I N A S. T Y. And it's a handy. Term. Yeah, no problem. It's a handy term. There's that, you know, it's got that mnemonic element to it. It has the word nasty in it. Um, and it is, it's something that, <laughs> we, yeah, well, I mean, but when you see it, I, you know, I, I, I guess I would say when you see it, you'll know it, you'll know that something is wrong. You'll look at the plant and you'll say, what is going on here? This is not right. Um, and when you see it, you know, large scale, then you, the, you, you, if environmental conditions are okay, if you haven't had, you know, a cold snap, a heat wave, things like this, then you, you can be reasonably sure that there's something going on that needs to be addressed. Um, I guess I should mention that, that in doing those bioassays, something that's very helpful, 
is to not only test a legume, but because these herbicides were developed for application on cereal grains and on grasses in general and hay fields, um, they obviously, they, they, they don't affect grasses, they don't cause the same problems. And so a really helpful way to bioassay is to do a legume, um, pea, for instance, clover, next, a broadleaf plant next to um, a grass. And that way, if you're seeing the same reaction in both, it's probably something environmental, something with temperature, something with high salts in a mix. If you're seeing the epinasty reaction in the broadleaf plant only, then unfortunately you can reasonably assume that you've got a problem with a persistent herbicide. So hopefully that's helpful. Um, so, so with heavy metals, I should say that first of all, um, most, most if not all commercial composters are required to and are, therefore are testing for heavy metals. That's something that is done. The EPA has established guidelines um, around, you know, you know, threshold contamination levels, and so, so at least periodically, um, tests are being done on compost and process to make sure that it doesn't exceed those levels. And of course, to look at trends to make sure that levels are not slowly creeping up towards that threshold over time, because of course that would signify a problem as well. Um, so on the one hand, compost will complex heavy metals. It will, it will actually pull them into the organic matter and it will bind them there and again, make them unavailable. Um, because of that, it, it has, compost itself has remedial potential. In other words, contaminated soil can be remediated to some, well, to a pretty great extent actually with the application of composts but only if those composts themselves have a low metal content. So, so in, 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 you know, in, in a soil system, certain heavy metals are more labile than others. In other words, they're more, they're more capable of shifting forms and shifting availabilities. And among those two are zinc and copper. They tend to be some of the most labile heavy metals. Um, so what will happen is a compost that has a low metal content that's applied to a contaminated soil will do an excellent job of complexing those heavy metals and rendering them unavailable to plants, unless the compost itself has a fairly high heavy metal content, in which case its complexing ability is lower. And at that point, actually through microbial action, these heavy metals become more plant available. Eleven o'clock. So, so, while it can be used as a remedial tool, the, the, the first line of defense here is to make sure that any compost that's being used on a farm or garden has been tested for heavy metals, that there is, that there is a history of testing for the producer. That's very important because again, um, one or two tests here and there are helpful but looking at that, that trend or that arc is really important. And ideally, there is no arc. There is no, there is no growth of heavy metal concentration in the compost and therefore in the soil of the, um, of the farm or the garden using it. Um, so that's something that, 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 that we want to be very, very, very careful that we understand. So if we're, if we're going to be asking about persistent herbicides, um, and about bioassays that are being done. We also want to know about heavy metal testing. Um, that being said, this is kind of a tragic indictment of of our society, but one of one of um, one of the most potent sources of heavy metals is sewer sludge. And a lot of companies um, don't use it for that reason. That's not to say that that, it's coming from human beings themselves, although you know some of it certainly is. Um, most of it is coming from um, you know industrial dumping into wastewater systems, which happens all the time. And you know that's the same reason that we end up with you know high levels of heavy metals in like aquatic organisms like fish, because these things are making their way into rivers and then into oceans, um, which is 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 really unfortunate. However. Um, 
one of the one of the best things that can be done is a, a composter or a farm that's going to be you know importing compost can make sure that the feedstocks used to generate that compost did not come from sewer sludge and did not come from you know um you know animal manure that was gener that was itself generated through the consumption of you know hay or grain for instance that was grown out of fields that had sewer sludge sewer sludge applied so this goes back to one of the things that we talked about earlier which is this this you know um this difficulty in sourcing feedstocks for composters as they bring them in from a wider and wider area the chances of contamination go up we saw that you know uh with 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 the pifa problems that were prevalent that have been that are prevalent in maine for instance that's where it really cropped up and really received a lot of media attention initially. Um, there were, you know, some 20 years ago, there were, there were, and on, there were, there were uh, large scale applications of sewer sludge to farm fields because it was, you know, it was at the time a very cheap fertility source. Um, this is something that as a person begins to farm or garden, open up new fields, lease fields, they're going to, it's, it's, the research that they could do into the history of um, of um, fertility applications on those fields is worth its weight in gold. It's something that it's it's not something to overlook. It's something that they're going to want to carefully consider, and they're going to want to understand what was applied and why. Um, again, vetting those feedstocks is is the best remedy, um, or I should say, the best prophylaxis, the best protection for for a composter or for a farmer or gardener. And um, and it's the duty of those comp composters to 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 know their materials and to carefully source them to make sure that they have relationships with the producers, with the generators, such that they that they can ask the hard questions and they can get honest answers. Um, and so there's there, there's a lot of thoughts that have to go into that. So, you know, again, you know, for a composter was was sewer sludge used at some point to fertilize hay or straw that was then used as animal feed or animal bedding. Um, you know, another major source of heavy metals tend to be, you know, phosphatic fertilizers. And when they're over-applied and they have been over-applied, um, that can cause, you know, you know, that, 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 that can, that can impart heavy metals um, into a soil that can then be taken up by plants and you can have higher counts in those plants. Um, you know, for people, this is a little less relevant to us, but for people who are doing mushroom cultivation, for instance, you know, being certain that 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 any kind of like woody spawn that they're using, for instance, um, is free of pressure treated materials to make sure that they're not bringing in, you know, high levels of like copper or arsenic, for instance, is very, very, very important. Um, luckily, this is a pretty established science and most compost companies, generators, will be testing and they will be looking at this but where it starts to get um where it starts to get a little sticky is um when we start talking about pfas so per and polyfluoral alkyl substances and these of course are fairly novel compounds that are that are used um and I'm sorry if I'm preaching to the choir here, but I'm just going to go through it. That are that are essentially used um, a lot in industrial processes and in food packaging um, to 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 guarantee that oil and water will slide off of the packaging um, much easier. And so these um and so these these compounds are, as you know, have been dubbed forever chemicals because it has been believed at least up until recently that they persist in the environment basically indefinitely. And in some situations, that certainly seems to be the case. And we've certainly seen that. Um, they are basically composed of carbon fluorine chains. They're extremely hard to break, at least, you know, through, through traditional methods, through traditional, um, you know, chemically treated methods, as well as through traditional like microbial metabolism. They don't seem to break down very easily. Um, I'm going to go through my notes on this a little bit because I had to write some of this down because this is an emerging field of science, and there have been there have been some there have been some very positive developments. Um, 
as I said, these things tend to come in swinging and our first reaction is a fear reaction. And, you know, that's, that's completely un understandable. And, um, however, there is more and more and more research and legislation being directed at these compounds, particularly, and perhaps we're late to the party. I don't know that we are though. So I'm just going to say that right now, the federal government in America has asked has not required that companies eliminate short chain short chain PFAS. There are a number of there are a couple long chain PFAS that were that were that were really bad contaminants um, that have been phased out, but that's because other compounds have been found that serve the same purpose and were actually easier to manufacture. So these companies voluntarily phased them out because they they simply weren't economical anymore. Um, right now. The federal government is is has has made a. I think the FDA has requested a voluntary phase out of short chain PFA compounds in food packaging, but again, this is a voluntary phase out, and it started in a, I want to say July of 2020. It was a three year phase out. There are only some companies that are complying, and those companies, essentially, as part of their voluntary agreement, and I I again go to the word voluntary. As part of their voluntary agreement, they they were allowed to keep stockpiles of PFA containing food packaging materials that they would then sell over a period of three years so that they didn't lose money on those inventories. So these, so, so even with the companies that are willing to phase these out, they're, they're doing so over a pretty long period of time. And they're going to continue to release PFA containing packaging into the market for the time being until for the ones that, that, that agreed to sort of sign this, um, this non-binding moratorium, they're going to keep doing that until about July of this summer, 2023. Um, however, there are a number of state governments that have stepped in, um, including Vermont, New York, Connecticut, Minnesota have outright banned um, PFAS and food packaging in the state. Um, and there are a number of states that are either that are that are promoting phase outs of these compounds and food packaging or their legislatures are right now considering laws that would um, that would institute the same sort of ban. So it, this is an issue in which, you know, regulation and legislation are, are kind of running to catch up with the times. Um, this is something that 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 as it, as it became an emerging problem, particularly in Maine, there were a lot of farms that began testing their soil. There were not there were not standards for PFA concentrations in um, there were not federal standards, EPA standards for toxic PFA con concentrations in soil. So you had these farms that were testing. They were finding any level of PFAS. And then as soon as they found PFAS, they were considered essentially contaminated. And so you had these farms that were then voluntarily not farming on the same land and were put into you know positions of economic hardship um, because they had done the right thing and they had tested in the first place. So so one of one of the real tragedies of this is that the industries that are generating these contaminants, there's nothing, at least at the federal level, that's legally binding them to phase these out. They're again, they're only doing so voluntarily. Meanwhile, the composters and farmers on the other ends, are the ones who then have to discontinue farming or have to discontinue selling their products if they find themselves to be contaminated with PFAS. And of course, you know, at economies of scale, they're the ones who are least able to deal with this kind of hardship as compared to these larger companies that are actually generating these contaminants. Um, so one of the things that becomes really, really, really important, and this is where this is where we can do something on the local level. Um, when we, you know, you know, kind of like knowing your enemy is, is really important. So understanding where are these compounds coming from? Obviously, again, sewer sludge source of heavy metal contamination is also a major source of PFA contamination for the same reason, i.e. Um, industrial, um, you know, in, industrial, um, industrial dumping into, um, in, into these sewer systems. So avoiding that, it's okay, obviously, we want to try to avoid that as much as we possibly can, unless and until a process is developed where, you know, sewer sludges can be remediated themselves. Um, but, at the, but at the local level, 
it's 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 certain types of food packaging and unfortunately and kind of ironically um compostable foodware that that are the sources of PFAS. So pizza boxes, fast food containers, candy wrappers, and again, compostable plastics tend to contain pretty high levels of PFAS. And those PFAS, of course, will bioaccumulate and they will build up. So one of the things that happens is, is when we have these large scale composting systems, you know, municipal compost systems, they certainly serve a purpose, but again, their main goal has to be bringing in as many resources as they can to produce as much compost as they can so they can generate the tipping fees to pay for all of their labor, to pay for all of their infrastructure, to pay for all the other carbonaceous feedstocks that they use to make their compost. And as such, they're put in a bind where they are more likely to accept, especially community food residuals that have not been source separated properly from packaging, especially plastic packaging that was treated with PFAS. And as such, these systems are at a, at, in a higher risk category for PFA contamination. So, so one of the really important things, and this is what I'm trying to promote, is community scale food residual recycling so that, so that it's easier to, to educate consumers, it's easier to educate restaurants, it's easier to educate grocery stores and potentially to exclude this packaging at the front end so that it's not making its way through, contaminating with PFAS, and then as we'll see when we talk about plastics and microplastics, being torn apart in a depackaging machine into smaller and smaller pieces that either you know, leach toxins into the mix or you know, essentially um, concentrate it with microplastics. This, this small scale food recycling in the context of composting as an industry is, is that's where the, I think the change can happen. I think that's where we can actually address some of these issues and potentially change behavior. It's grassroots. We're starting at the very base. So, you know, this is something that I think, however, the one hand does wash the other. So as there's more grassroots education and understanding of the dangers of these compounds, the more pressure there is on legislators to um, to actually create mandates that will restrict their use. And at a certain point, that, that, that grassroots effort becomes a groundswell that pushes enough state legislatures to move in the direction that they, um, that they potentially will affect federal legislation and overturn any kind of like industry lobbying efforts to keep these compounds in so that these compounds will actually um, become restricted and eventually will be phased out, if not voluntarily, um, will be phased out, you know, legislatively or, or, or through regulation. Um, so, so knowing where you're sourcing your compost, again, is important. So you want to be making sure that they're doing bioassays, that they understand where their feedstocks come from to be sure that there's not contamination with heavy metals. Also, they, you want to be sure that particularly if they're bringing in food residuals, that ideally they're bringing them in in such a way that, they're, that, that, that they are excluding as much plastic packaging as possible. Um, and so that's going to be another conversation with a composter about if they compost food residuals, exactly how they do that um, and who they deal with in doing so are they working with large scale haulers you know i don't want to i i i don't want to focus to you know i don't want to sort of i don't want to come off i don't want it to seem like i'm condemning large scale haulers in vermont for instance we had a law called act 148 um, that had mandated um, recycling of food residuals in the composting stream and when this was implemented um, one of the things that that did is that 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 meant that the only operators that could really jump in and actually meet the demand were these large scale haulers. But it's the same large scale haulers that are then using depackaging machines that are actually tearing these plastics apart and incorporating them into the food stream that are then landing on a, um, on, on a composter's pallet, if you will. So the more that we can do to source and to promote 
small scale composting efforts where people actually work with the haulers directly and have expectations and um and and criteria for the type of food residuals they receive the the better off we are and the less likely we are to have something like PFA contamination um i do want to touch on with PFAs because these carbon fluorine bonds have been called you know the forever bond and these have been called therefore forever chemicals in the last year alone there are a number of different techniques that have come out um that are being that are not they're, they're they're not they're not at industrial scale yet, but they are being um, they are being explored for their potential in in breaking down the carbon fluorine bond and therefore breaking down PFAS and basically rendering them harmless and therefore decomposable. Um, so there are a number of there there are a couple different solutions. One of them involves the use of basically lye and dimethyl um, um, sulfoxide in drinking water. Um, another one that's used in drinking water is an exposure to iodide and sulfites in the presence of UV light. Both of these break down the carbon fluorine, bo fluorine sorry, bonds um, and then allow these chemicals to be either extracted or to, be, um, or, or to break down into harmless constituents in drinking water. Contaminated soils, it's been found, can now be, can now be um, excavated and treated um, using a process called ball milling. I won't go too far into it, but essentially metal balls are spun at a high velocity through a mix of, um, at this point, a non-corrosive additive like uh, boron nitride and contaminated soil that causes a solid state reaction that essentially strips the carbon fluorine bond apart. And these, these formerly PFA compounds, again, are rendered into fairly harmless constituents that can then be broken down by soil microbes very easily. However, the most the most hopeful development, and this was again just in the last year, um, was there. There was some research done that had that had you that had basically it, it. It gets a little weird, and it's we're talking about you know like something out of Frankenstein here, but but essentially um, a plant-like substrate had been grown, so a a, a lignocellulosic tissue had been developed. Um, and it was basically grown in, you know, like large scale Petri dishes, and it was contaminated with different PFA compounds, a number of them. It concentrated these compounds. Then um, a very specific white rot fungus, uh, which is Urpex lacteus, which is a really common temperate climate white rot fungus. You'll, you'll see it if you take a walk in the autumn after the leaves have come off the trees. You'll see it. It's, a, it's, it's basically a polypore, but that grows in patches on um, often the underside of, um, of dead branches on trees. Um, again, it's very common. This, um, this white rot fungus, this polypore, actually broke down the carbon fluorine bonds. So because these things were concentrated into this plant-like tissue, and then the plant-like tissue was then basically broken down by this fungus, the fungus was able to also break down the PFA compounds. And I mean, break them down as in like, break the carbon fluorine bonds and render them harmless. So this sounds like, okay, yeah, that's great. It, here's this one species and here's this very specific process that relies on concentrating PFAS in order to make this, this, um, this decomposition possible. However, I, 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 do, I, I wanna go back and I wanna reiterate that because we've only cataloged some 6.6% of you know, um, terrestrial and aquatic fungal species, that leaves about, you know, roughly 93% of these species unexplored. It's reasonable to assume that if this one temperate climate white rot fungus can break down PFA concentrations, that there is, there is the potential, there is the, the, the breakdown potential um, across, across a wide spectrum of different fungal species that we simply don't know yet. And this is why, again, what I'm trying to promote here is, and, and this is something that for farmers and for gardeners who are purchasing compost, I, I do want to promote compost that has been given an adequate maturation process with minimal turning so that fungi growing in that compost are not damaged, they're hyphae, you're not literally torn apart in turning. And as a result, they're able to proliferate and you're able to have not only high fungal counts, but a high fungal species diversity. In my mind, that makes it far more likely that we will have a suite of microorganisms that are capable of working on these compounds. 
and are capable of breaking them down. And I know that this is maybe less than what some of you may want to hear. You want to hear that we have, you know, some magic bullet that's going to solve this problem outright. Um, and what I'm saying is that is that we don't exactly, but we do know that species diversity in compost, particularly fungal species diversity and fungal species um, proliferation is is really, 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 really important. And it is the best defense that we have to protect against, um, against, you know, whether it's persistent herbicides, whether it's, you know, pyrolid, um, I'm sorry, persistent herbicides, whether it's heavy metals or whether it's PFA compounds. Right now, that is the, the you know, the best defense that we have, essentially. Um, the top-down approach is important too. We do need to see in time, legislation at the, at the local, state, federal levels that address this issue and eventually phase these compounds out so that they are not ubiquitous the way that they are now. Um, however, happening at the same time as that, we, we, we need to see composts that are generated with high fungal counts. That, I think, is the place where we have the best chance of um, doing this, this remedial work. So... I think that um, I think that the same thing kind of applies to ag soils. A lot of ag soils um, are managed in ways that compaction can be too high. Um, that that you know tillage is a very important tool, obviously, and but when tillage is overdone, organic matter is burned up which means you lose your ability to complex any of those heavy metals um, and they actually become plant available. And additionally, um, you know, webs of saprophytic fungal hyphae are destroyed, which means that you lose the remedial potential of that, that, fungal, um, of that fungal diversity. So it's very important that people look at their tillage practices as well. And they do everything that they can to create, to, 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 to incubate fungi in their soil and to sustain those cultures um, using judicious tillage practices. So um, does anyone wanna step in and ask any questions about PFAS and heavy metals specifically? Uh, there are a few questions in the chat, Jay, but if, any, if whomever asked them wants to just unmute yourself and go ahead and ask, that would be great. Okay. Hi, Jay. My name is Jay as well. Thank you so much for the presentation. I have a, I have a qu question about uh, heavy metals specifically. I'm just wondering if you can re recommend any good references um, for comparing laboratory analyses of compost to a range of low or benign up to high or problematic levels of, uh, of heavy metals. Yeah, absolutely. I would say so. So the EPA has their own um, has their own guidelines, and then different states have essentially different thresholds that they recommend. So looking at at your state's Department of Environmental Conservation, Department of Natural Resources, and searching there um, for their thresholds, I would say that that's probably the best place to go. Um, and if you're looking at numbers that approximate those, you know, or that 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 come very close to them. Um, then you may want to be thinking about that source. Um, I think that 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 it's 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 tough to say that there's like it's like a one size fits all, you know. So I don't think that you're going to be able. I think that 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 again, talking to um, a compost producer and kind of seeing what they've seen historically, if if levels are remaining like you said benign below that threshold but also are not are not trending higher over time then you have you know then then you have you have you you can be reasonably assured that they've got um, a clean source of feedstocks and that they're 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 processing and they're sourcing in a way that minimizes the danger from heavy metals but again going on to the EPA does have guidelines i can maybe after the talk i'll try to quickly post those um and additionally different states do so you can definitely look that up and find those numbers for your state they are different state by state honestly i'm not entirely sure um why different states have different thresholds um 
I, you know, I don't know if that has to do with a history of industry in certain areas and a certain level of tolerance for heavy metals because of, you know, the historical context. I don't know. Um, but I would recommend, I would recommend starting with department, you know, agency, natural resource type, you know, th those types of agencies and searching through there and you should be able to find um, their heavy metal guidelines. Thank Hopefully you very much. Helps. Yeah, that's great. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. um okay so we had someone else here um that says they would love links that you recommend to better understand the PFAS as well as fungal websites that maybe we can check out to understand the science um I don't know if that's something that you could make available maybe to us and we could post on the conference website if you do have any of those resources but that would be great I, yeah I do I do let me let me go through and kind of streamline those um and then and then I will and then I will submit those to you all and then let you disseminate them from there, if that's OK. That would be fantastic. Thank you so much. Yeah. And, and I did want to apologize to all the attendees. You know, this would have been wonderful. This would have been wonderful to have on a slideshow and present, but I'm very busy with work. And so this is actually a very busy season for us. This is not the slow season. Um, today is slow because it's so cold, but but it's been incredibly busy up to this point. And I honestly did not have time to actually sit down and, and, and kind of create like, you know, a marquee of information. I recognize that would have been much more helpful for everybody. So I, you know, I, you know, thank you for attending despite the lack um, that is really appreciated. And I will send those links as soon as we're done so that they can be disseminated. So the one of so the last two things we don't have much time left so i want to try to move quickly through these um reasonably quickly plastics and microplastics a lot of the same things can be said that are said of pfas and often again pfas are used on different you know plastics used in food packaging so you know um some of this a lot of the same rules apply as far as sourcing the best thing is going to be um, you know, working with small scale haulers, small scale composters, if we can, to make sure that we're not receiving um, food residuals that have gone through a depackaging machine where plastic has essentially been shredded into tiny pieces um, that are then impossible to pick out. The, the other thing to consider, um, you know, at, at scale for composters is a lot of large scale compost operations utilize windrow turners. And you may have seen these before. Um, you know, they have like a, they have like a, they have like a large frame that's sort of like a, um, it's sort of like a horseshoe. They have tracks on either side. They then drive down a compost windrow and through the center is an auger or a series of auger, augers with um, what almost look like, you know, flail mower blades that essentially turn this compost and they, they, they invert it. So they turn it. So the outside is in and the inside is out. They completely in invert the pile. However, they do also you know, reduce particle size to some extent. They 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 break this pile up as they as they turn it. They are chopping it. And you can imagine that if a compost is already contaminated with large volumes of plastic, that plastic is then going to be cut into even smaller pieces. Um, and it's going to be spread throughout the compost. The the other issue there is we've talked about, you know, you know, fungi as remediators in composting systems um, and a lot of promising science that 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 points to their potential. The, one of the biggest issues is that when windrows are turned that way, and I don't mean to, I understand that that some people, some companies are operating at scale, and and they they have to go through a lot of material in order to make room for more material to come. And as such, they are you know this is a method that that they they simply need to use. Um, but when this is happening, and particularly when it's happening during the curing phases, when fungi predominate the composting process the hyphae are being damaged, they are being chopped apart, they are being killed. And that means that they don't achieve the same kind of counts. And as a result, that 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 remedial potential, again, of the fungi is reduced dramatically. Um, so we don't, you know, ideally, ideally, um, ideally, we're doing everything that we can to to reduce the chances of you know, chopping up any plastic that may be found in the compost. Um, but there's a lot of, 
I, I have a lot of facts and figures about about plastics, about biodegradable plastics versus non biodegradable plastics, and where this is. I don't think I'm really going to go into it because those figures are um, kind of depressing and you know kind of oppressive. They 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 kind of weigh on you. I think what I'll go into instead, um, in the interest of of optimism and brevity, is I'm going to go into um, some of the some of the hopeful potentials that we're seeing and again there there is we are seeing some remedial potential with uh certain types of fungi so one of the things that we found is there were undergraduate researchers from yale who did some research in ecuador where they found that um they found that an endophytic fungi that is um that is endogenous in that area uh it's a pastella <laughs> pastella diopsis microspora um, will actually break down polyurethane, and I mean completely break it down, and it will even do so in anaerobic environments. So this is one I had mentioned earlier. There is some hope, although you know there are no, there's no pilot programs or working models at this point. There is some hope that it could be applied to um, to landfills, for instance, where it would um, thrive in anaerobic conditions and actually break down a number of different polyurethane and potentially polyethylene um types of plastic so um this is this is being explored it's you know again species diversity is important because these landfills are going to be full of heavy metals and other contaminants that could actually um that could actually you know basically select out a species like um like this pastella diopsis um it basically wouldn't survive unless there are also other species that are doing work to complex um, heavy metals and reduce other contaminants. So, you know, so again, species diversity is very important. And that's been a big stumbling block in some of this research is that when some of these, um, when some of these fungi are introduced, they fail to thrive because of other contaminants in the sites. Um, however, there, there is other work that's being done. And there's a, there's actually a scientist who's working at the World Agroforestry Center in China right now named Serun Khan who had um, developed a novel aspergillus species that was also capable of breaking down polyurethane. Um, you know, he, since doing that, he, he, his work kind of expanded and he went into looking at uh, trying to find a number of different species of fungi that can perform similar work. And he's found over 50 species that have the capability of degrading different types of plastic. So not just polyurethane, um, but you know, also also polyethylene, polypropylene, and um, I want to say I want to say uh, polyethylene terephthalate, which is a particularly noxious um, type of plastic that really does not like to biodegrade easily. Um, there are researchers in Europe that have developed that have uh, found a certain strain of Pseudomonas fungi that's capable of degrading polyethylene, and again, polyethylene terephthalate. Um, and there is even a French company called Carbios that has engineered an enzyme. The enzyme was originally found in a compost pile. They have then re-engineered it to make it uh, more efficacious, and it's capable of breaking down this really hard to degrade polyethylene terephthalate. So, of course, what that implies, what we can infer from that, is that if this was originally derived from a compost pile, it means that there are certain enzymes being secreted by especially fungi and compost that have the potential to break down uh, plastics. And right now, there is some really hopeful research uh, that's come out of Germany um, that shows that our common and edible oyster mushrooms are very, very, very good at breaking down different types of plastic. And that's not to say that we're going to necessarily be inoculating compost piles with oyster mushrooms, but it is, again, to point to species diversity um, as being sort of the arbiter of um, contaminant remediation. So, you know, for 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 for, the, for those of us in organic agriculture, composters should do everything they can to limit plastic inclusions. They should do everything that they can to really, really, really consider trying to remove plastics, and you know, manually or potentially through screening early in the process, and then using a light fan to blow off light plastics that are coming through on the conveyor belts um, in that stream in order to reduce its potential to um, lose particle size 
and to get smaller and smaller and to be broken into infinitesimally smaller and smaller pieces as it goes through that process. Um, and then for composters, the more that we can, compost has been made traditionally in very specific ways that tend to create a bacterially dominant compost. And if we can begin to shift into composts that use more woody debris, um, so more of that lignocellulosic material, if you will, that tends to favor fungi that like to digest more complex carbon molecules, then we're also going to be creating a compost that selects for fungi that have similar enzymatic potential to digest plastics. And it's looking like PFAS, you know, again, that, that polypore, that, that urbex um, is, is, is a, is a white rot fungus. It digests um, dead wood basically. So, uh, so again, it seems like that's where the greatest hope lies. And so beginning to work on compost that can perform that function is, is a, a way that the industry itself may want to shift. And that's something that happens when farmers also begin asking for it. Um, Dr. David Johnson of New Mexico State University was someone who had pioneered a composting method that he called the Johnson Sioux method, uh, named after his, his wife. He and his wife had developed it together. And this method uses really, really, really high lignin content. So it uses a lot of wood and minimal turning. Um, there are actually holes, air passageways are manually created into what's called a bioreactor, which is essentially a vessel that holds um, a certain volume of this compost. Air passageways are put through it so that air can move, can infiltrate throughout the entire um, compost pile which will promote the growth of aerobic fungi um, without, you know, chopping this pile apart and therefore damaging or killing these species. Um, I did look online and I found that there were some questions that had been asked to Dr. David Johnson directly about the potential for these, for this method to degrade plastic. And he said that in his own tests, that yes, he had seen that they were, these fungi were actually breaking down plastics. However, they were doing it very slowly. Um, and, and in a way that it, that it was almost negligible. However, what I will say is that this Johnson Sioux method is one method and in traditional compost piles, um, if, a, if there's a long maturation time and the pile is turned minimally in that time, then fungi will proliferate. And this is a place that perhaps some sort of like hybrid between the Johnson Sioux method and traditional, the, what they would call the indoor windrow composting method, you know, aerobic composting as we know it, perhaps there's some sort of hybrid there where we, we, we work intentionally to lengthen that maturation phase and to do as little turning as possible, maybe manually creating air passageways and maybe starting with a compost that has a higher wood content from the beginning, making sure we have an adequate thermophilic phase so we're eliminating human and plant pathogens. We're culturing a lot of, of a, a high diversity of bacterial species but then we're also allowing that, that long maturation phase um, and high lignin and cellulose content to culture a lot of different fungal species. And perhaps there is somewhere in there a, a hybrid model that because of, because of the higher nutritional content in this, this hybrid model of composting I'm describing, those fungi can grow quicker and can metabolize quicker and have a better chance of breaking down plastics um, at, at, at a rate that you know, that, that makes, that makes this a viable option. Um, I'm not suggesting that composting be the way that we remediate plastics, because that would imply that, well, we're going to put plastic into compost intentionally in order to break it down into harmless constituents. And I'm not implying that, but I am saying that, that limiting it on the front end as much as possible by focusing on community scale composting systems that can exclude it, that can educate so that the plastic isn't entering the food stream, but also developing composting techniques that that really work to promote its breakdown. Um, that 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 using those two methods, we have a better chance, I think, of reducing plastic content and therefore PFA content in compost and therefore in ag soils. Um, so. That is what I will say about plastics for now. Um, for those of you who came here hoping that I was going to like unveil, you know, you know, some sort of like magical treatment that, you know, that, that cures it all in 10 days. I'm not, but I will say that 
one of the other hopeful things is that the research that's being done, if, if we can find viable ways using, you know, certain engineered enzymes or using certain cultured, you know, fungi or bacteria to break down PFAS, plastics um, at scale, then these are things that can become part of a standard solid waste process. And that means that we can start to design our regulatory structure around, um, around treatment of, of packaging, right? So that hopefully it's not entering the food stream. We, we recognize its detriment. And we also recognize that we have a better way to deal with it than simply landfilling it and allowing it to, you know, to, to, to break down over the course of thousands of years, releasing methane as it does, right? So the hope is that we are entering this brave new world where we're going to create commercially viable recycling options that then causes us to divert these materials that way so that they stop entering the food stream um, to the same degree that they are now. That may not be as hopeful as what some of you would like to hear, but there is a lot of hope. These problems, you know, we're talking about this here. Obviously, all of you folks have interest in, in hearing what I have to say. I really appreciate that. Um, but these, you know, these things are recognized at large. It's in the zeitgeist, you might say. And so there is there is a lot of research that is being directed, particularly towards PIFA remediation and plastic remediation. And this is something that um that I think will continue as we go on because, you know, these, these, these were, you know, these were fringe concerns. Um, even like 10 years ago, this was something that wasn't being discussed, um, you know, with the same, with the same like tenacity that we're talking about it now. Now it seems like this immediate problem. Well, it's been building all of these years. Unfortunately, human intervention takes so long to catch up with the problems we're creating in industrial society but it is starting to catch up. The research is there. There is more and more grant money for it. And there is more interest. Like I said, this company Carbios in, in France, I believe is a publicly traded company. So the work that they're doing um, is, is, is very real and soon to be most likely very applicable. Um, and it's receiving real attention. There is an understanding that we need to address these problems. We cannot allow them to continue ad infinitum. And um, there is a lot of interest, not just from, you know, um, the the you know the organic agriculture family, but you know from, you know from from different governmental bodies, and from um, different research institutions and universities, and from different venture capitalists and corporate sectors that want to find, um, a, you know, a you know a method that can be monetized and used. And in a market-based economy, ultimately. It, there, there will have to be, you know, some, some sort of, you know, monetization component. The, you know, there will have to be a method that can be used that, that generates a profit um, in order for it to be, you know, built up at commercial scale and then for it to become uh, a regular part of our, the way we handle our waste stream. But there is hope, the research is being done. There is a lot moving in this direction. So I would say that, like, I mean, they, you know, that old, that, that, that old idiom, it's always darkest before the dawn, right? It, it, it's really easy to talk about this stuff and to, to feel hopeless. And I'm saying that, that there are a lot of people concerned and there's a lot of ingenuity that is, being, that is being directed this way right now. I think that for us in organic agriculture, one of the most important things that we can do is to really hold the line on species diversity, whether that's in our soils to research the best ways to do that, by being careful with our tillage practices to our composting methods. Um, and, you know, to the way even that we manage forest ecosystems, you know, for instance, making sure that that we're not creating, you know, in 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 areas where logging is is a major economic force, that we're not creating monocultures in forests because those vegetative monocultures promote, you know, soil microbiological monocultures. Um, you tend to lose soil diversity when you lose vegetative diversity and vice versa. So for us, what we can really bring to the conversation, we're not gonna, we're not gonna get involved in the high tech solution end and that's fine, but we should be getting involved and in really, really, really pushing 
um, to make sure that the importance of diversity of all life forms is understood and respected, that all of these life forms have a role to play, a very crucial role. And as I said, we've only named 6.6% .6 of all known terrestrial and aquatic fungal species. There is so much that we don't know, which means there is so much potential out there. Um, and I feel like that is our duty is to promulgate that is, is to, I don't want to say preach it, which is kind of what I'm doing now, but, but, but to really, to really promote that and to really hold the line and to really work in our own farms, our own gardens, our own compost operations, our own forests and fields to maintain that diversity, to understand the ways to do it and then to promote it as best as we can. I think that that is, I think that is our biggest hope as far as organic agriculture goes. Um, the final issue that I wanted to talk about, I, I don't, we don't have a ton of time. Thank you guys for staying on. I really appreciate that. I did want to talk a little bit about um, invasive annelids, snake worms. I, I know that there is another talk on that, so I don't want to go too far into it because you'll, you'll get this in, in much greater depth. Um, but I do want to touch on it a little bit because, you know, some of the things we've been talking about are abiotic contaminants, contaminants resulting from industrial society. Um, industrial society is kind of synonymous with globalized society anymore, right? And so I guess that I would say this is not an industrial problem that I'm discussing, but this is a, a problem of globalization. Global trade confers a lot of benefits. We all know that because, you know, I mean, we, we look at our lives and we look at all the things that have been brought into them. And, um, but there's a lot of drawbacks. There's a lot of problems. And one of the biggest problems, of course, is, is the proliferation of invasive species. And this is something that we've, we've seen this for a long time. This is, this is old. This is why the American chestnuts were lost here on the East Coast of the United States um, because of you know, the importation of the chestnut blight. Um, some would argue that was going to happen eventually with human trade and travel. But of course, the, the, the pace is so accelerated now. We're moving goods and people around the globe at an unprecedented rate. And as the population increases, you know, that rate of transfer increases as well. So snake worms have been here for some time. I want to say that they arrived, I want to say it was in the 1930s in botanical gardens in New York City. Don't quote me on that. I'm sorry if I'm, I'm sorry if that's incorrect, but I want to say it was in 1930s or 1940s. Um, they've been here for a while, but of course they have been spreading more rapidly um, because of their ability and and their their proclivity for mulches so they they infiltrate mulches they live in mulches um they actually contain uh peroxidase enzymes which are uh lignanolytic meaning they 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 are most worms cannot digest woody material these uh amenthus and metafire the, the these two genera of what we, we we call them snake worms and the one is you know sort of synonymous with the other but they are two distinct um uh genera they they contain these lignanolytic enzymes which allow them to break down woody material and that means that they are transferred and they're being transferred much more rapidly now because of you know the explosion of urban and suburban landscaping projects so they've they've spread through a, a lot of times through mulch and through um through through uh through 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 nursery plants or plants cultured in nurseries and you know, as you guys probably know, the, the real issue here is that when they get into a sylvan ecosystem, a forested ecosystem, they rapidly break down the O horizon, that organic horizon in the soil. They break down leaf litter, which interrupts nutrient cycling. A lot of those forest plants, especially understory plants, and, um, and, and the next generation of trees emerging to replenish that forest canopy are dependent on that leaf litter for a very slow and fungally mediated nutrient cycle. When that is interrupted and it's converted rapidly into um, these worm castings, the castings are very alkaline. That changes the pH of that, that, that upper tier, the O and the A horizon of those soils, which means that understory plants and that next generation of trees trying to root in, um, they, they have trouble finding purchase in the soil because it's now predominantly castings. There's a lot of air space and the roots will desiccate. Also, they find a very different pH than what they have um, evolved to thrive in. 
And so you can lose the entire understory of a forest and often a forest that is infested with invasive snake worms will look like that. You'll have a canopy of trees and then you'll have very little growing underneath it or only certain plants that are able to thrive in that kind of environment. What that ultimately means for the forest ecosystems in these places where they're prevalent, we don't know. We don't know, we don't know where it's gonna go and what's gonna happen. Um, one of the things that, and this is, you know, this is, this is me trying to maybe, you know, trying to maybe find a silver lining, but, you know, I, I had attended a snakeworm conference there. A question was asked, well, you know, why is it that in their native habitat, um, which is anywhere from the Southern Koreas down through, um, down through Japan, the, the, through, through Japan and the Southern islands on the Southern terminus of Japan, why is it that they're not a pest there? Is it because there's some sort of, you know, you know, predator that targets them specifically that we don't have here? Do we need to import that? And the answer was probably not. They were never able to single out a predator or, or you know, um, or certain predators that, that specifically targeted snakeworms. What they found was that most of the hardwood forest there tended to be dominated by oak. Oak leaves, of course, were high in tannins. They didn't provide as good a food source for snakeworms, but those were a good um, food source for anisic worms. So like your, your burrowing earthworms that come up to the surface to feed, but primarily live in burrows. And those worms were simply able to outcompete um, these, these amenthus and metafire species of what we call invasive snakeworms. So the silver lining that I'm alluding to is that in time, you know, our own forest here in the Northeast, you know, replete with, um, with, with sugar maples, red maples, uh, yellow birch, paper birch. Um, a lot of these forests are highly vulnerable to, to uh, snakeworm activity. Because of the shifting climate, because of, you know, the importation of these worms, you know, we may see these forests, their, their character begin to change. But, you know, as we know, nature abhors a vacuum. And I would think that, that the trajectory of the canopy cover here in the Northeast is probably going to go in favor of like an oak hickory dominant forest, which we see not much further south, like in Pennsylvania in the mid and southern Appalachians, you know, you see oak hickory, tulip poplar species like that predominate. That should present a much uh, less advantageous um, ecosystem for snake worms. And so in time, I'm not going to say in time, the problem will solve itself, but in time, some sort of balance will probably establish. In the meantime, none of us want to be guilty of disseminating snake worms. I especially don't as a composter. Um, I have, you know, I have an obligation not to. And so that means, um, so that means that that there, there, there are a couple things that I'll speak to what we do specifically as a company to exclude snake worms. They are, again, they're increasingly ubiquitous as well. Um, and as such, it's something that, you know, there, there, is, there is a real danger of us encountering them or importing them. But one of the things that, that we have seen is that there are, there, are some very, there are some very straightforward, reasonable prophylaxes that can be taken. So our preventative measures, compost pads, um, compost pads are not, are not necessarily compacted, but we do tend to maintain our compost pads with a certain layer of crushed limestone, which creates a very unfavorable environment for any sort of worms to live. Um, so snake worms are, it, this is not an official term, but they are considered epi-endogeic. So in, 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 so, so an endogeic worm is a worm that lives and feeds entirely, um, you know, in, in sort of subsoil horizons. They stay in the ground for the most part. Pale worms are an example. You see them sometimes when it rains heavily and they're driven out of burrows, but, you, but, but for the most part, you, you don't even see these worms. Epigeic worms um, are like your, your Icenia fetida, your, your red wigglers. Epigeic worms live in a, 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 a organic layer, in a litter layer. They feed exclusively on litter. They also live in it, which makes them extremely useful for vermicompost operations, for instance. Um, they will survive in compost piles, and we will find them in our compost piles. However, they don't require, um, they don't require burrows. 
in the soil to survive. They will, they will live in that compost, they will tumble along with it, and they will culture there. And it's easy to say, well, if you have, you know, Icenia fetida, if you have red wigglers, how do you know you don't have snakeworms? Well, snakeworms, again, it's, this is not an official term, but they are epiindogeic, meaning they, they feed in the leaf litter layer and they live there, but they will also burrow to some extent because they're annual worms. They don't survive more than a year. They can't survive through the cold. Um, they will, at, at, the, at the end of the season, in late summer, as nights get cooler, they will start to burrow to try to get deeper to protect themselves. They are not anisic. The other category of earthworms, like, like your lumbricus terrestris, your, your, your nightcrawler, which lives in burrows that can be as, you know, sometimes as deep as, you know, nine feet, 10 feet down into the ground, potentially, depending on soil type. Um, those worms will live in those burrows, but they don't feed there. They'll come up to the surface to feed. They'll go back down. Um, anisic worms are, you know, they are an introduced species as well, but they're incredibly beneficial in that, at least in, in farm and garden soils, in that they will break down material on the soil surface and they will then bring it down to deeper levels. And of course, their burrows and all of their myriad tunnels through the soil create air passageways and, um, and passageways for water as well. They also, as I said, they, 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 they bring those nutrients to deeper and deeper levels. Um, and then they also introduce certain soil microbes that are highly beneficial up to the surface. So, so they, they serve this twofold purpose in farm and garden soils. Um, because snakeworms, however, are not anisic, they don't actually live in these burrows. The burrows they do make are Yes, they go into the soil, but they don't go very deeply and they can't really do so in compacted soils or in soils um, that are structurally unfavorable for them. So they do very well in forest soils, which tend to be very soft and which tend to be run through with fungal hyphae because fungi, again, are the main nutrient mediators or arbiters of nutrients in a forest setting. You can think about endo and ectomycorrhizal fungi that actually acquire nutrients and then um, trade those nutrients and move them from plant to plant. Um, and those fungi have effectively tilled those forest soils and made them not everywhere, um, especially in the Northeast, we have podzel soil types, which tend to be, you know, you know, slightly more dense and very acidic. But in a lot of our hardwood forests, which would also favor snakeworm infestations, those soils tend to be fungally dominant and they provide, you know, very, very easy um, uh, egress for snakeworms that want to get off of the surface and get down to avoid those cold temperatures. So on our compost pads, you know, we are very careful to work on pads where, again, we've put down this layer of crushed limestone so that we, for, for many reasons, part of it is, is, is for, you know, the travel of our own heavy equipment so we can adequately turn these piles. But another part of it is, is it serves this, um, it serves this secondary purpose of protecting these piles from snakeworm infestations. Um, simply put, these worms are are basically unlikely to migrate their way onto and across a compost pad. Um, one of the things that is one of the things that's worth experimenting with, and this is something that can be done in a home garden setting, is that um, I have personally done some trials involving uh, mulch that has been treated with a biochar. And there is some proof that biochar, when it's ingested by snake worms, will actually kill them. Um, we're not sure of the mode of action. It may, be, it may be that they ingest it. It may be that it desiccates them from the outside in. But what I found was I found that, and these were trials that were done small scale in totes. Um, th these were not being done in the field. Um, we do want to replicate these, and we are trying to get to a place that we're working with the university to actually replicate these and to do larger scale field trials. But I found that by creating a mulch that had about 30% biochar by volume, um, snake worms would be drawn into it. They would be attracted to it. They would prefer it. When I gave them options of, you know, um, of different materials like compost, like peat moss, um, like hardwood chips, I found that, that, that their preferred thing was, was a bark mulch usually made of hardwood bark. Um, they, would, they would go into this and at below 30% biochar inclusion, there was some mortality within a couple of weeks, but it was not 100%. Um, in the control, which was just hardwood bark, there was basically no mortality. The snake worms were thriving. 
in 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 the tote that contained the 30 percent biochar mix uh, we had 100 percent mortality within two weeks so again we want to replicate these in the field and particularly in probably nursery settings we want to see you know can we actually put them in places that we know are contaminated with snake worms where the snake worms will be drawn into the mulch because they do prefer it so you could place this mulch down on a contaminated site, whether that's an ornamental planting, whether that's in an orchard, potentially in a forest setting, or especially at a nursery where these, these plants, you know, that are, that are going to be sitting on this mulch are going to be distributed. We want to see, can we draw the snake worms in and then basically eliminate them? This is a mix that you could make at home. So if you have um, a garden that is at risk or like an ornamental planting that's at risk, um, mulching it with a, with a hardwood bark that has been treated with a 30% biochar is again, we're in that experimental phase, but it's something that's worth looking at to see because it does seem to draw them in and it definitely kills them um, in a very short period of time. It has the added benefit of, um, of, of lowering the CN ratio. These worms, these worms are incredibly protein rich. So as they die, especially if there's a large number of them, as they die, it causes the mulch to break down very rapidly which means that as that microbial action increases, you actually create these complex organic matter molecules that replenish the organic matter that was lost to the snake worms in the first place. Um, so we've had a question just yeah, real quick ahead. about what you're talking about. Yep. Uh, someone wants to know, does the biochar harm other worm, worms or life in the compost? Um, so, so yes, it can. And this is where, again, it's not something that I would apply in compost because we do have these endogenous populations of red wigglers. Um, this would be something that that I that I would only advise applying to a place where you have reason to assume that you could have an infestation or you know that you do. Um, because what tends to happen in those places is that the snake worms will dramatically outcompete. Um, all other species of of our, you know, native worms, if you will, like night crawlers are not really native, so calling them that, but but you know what I mean, I think. Um, and so, in 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 those places, like in an ornamental planting, you're probably not going to have red wigglers in the first place, um, and they don't contain the lignolytic enzymes that allow them to actually decompose that woody material. They're still eating. Um, they're actually eating fungi and bacteria, microbes that live in amongst and complex organic matter. That's what they're actually eating. So they, in theory, and I, I have to, you know, you know, I, I have to give that caveat in theory. I'm not going to claim that this is an absolute because again, we are still experimenting with this, but in theory, um, red wigglers and um, anisic worms, like your night crawlers are, they, they, they literally can't digest that woody material. And so they're, they're less likely to get into that mulch in the first place, but it is um, the preferred playground of your amenthus and your metafire. They, it's, it's really, it's, it's kind of, I would even go so far as to say it's kind of disturbing um, how attracted to woody material they are. It's, it's remarkable. They're, they're very, it, it acts as a lure. They're very drawn to it and preferentially so. Um, and we just have not you know, I, it's it's not something, this is something that in field trials, we are going to be looking at. We're going to be looking at the ecological impact, you know, both on other worms, but also um, the ecological impact of, you know, of of putting that much biochar into like a, a concentrated area. Um, we don't think that there would be any issue, especially if the mulch then starts to break down rapidly, that biochar would actually sequester nutrients and would be, you know, rendered harmless as it begins to take on more and more nutrients and organic matter in and around its pore spaces and basically um, adsorb nutrients onto it, which would change its shape. Um, it would reduce its efficacy most likely. So it, you know, there would be a point where once that mulch is broken down enough, it's not going to kill any more snake worms or any worms for that matter, because the biochar is, the, its very shape has changed. It can't, it can't serve the same, um, the same function. Um, but that's, you know, that's, that's part of the design and part of the beauty of it. We are hoping is that it, it eliminates an infestation and then again, breaks down and replenishes organic matter and hopefully does so without impacting other worm populations and without leaching any kinds of, um, you know, of, 
you know, any kinds of toxins or, or raising the pH dangerously um, after its application. I hope, I hope that answers the question somewhat anyway. Um, so as, as kind of a final note, you know, um, the, the jury is still out, so to speak, on snake worms and the best way to control them and contain them. There are some other things that people can try. An early season application of, uh, of tea tree seed meal is something that's being recommended. Um, the saponins are thought to kill them. That's also being researched right now um, at at University of Vermont. That's something that we will see, you know, that, that we, we you know, we need to have an understanding of the mode of action. We also need to have an understanding of the potential ecological impacts of that application. So these are, I mean, the question is a great question because, you know, you know, this is this is the other thing where we're getting away from talking about fungi to remediate certain toxins and compost or in soils, and we're talking about, you know, actually actively trying to eliminate populations of certain animals, which is what they are. Um, and of course, you know, in so doing, do we create greater problems? And that's something that this is, this is like the second tier of this, of all this research that's being done right now on snake worms. There's, you know, first, what is, what is the efficacy? How, you know, what can we do to actually control these populations? And the second thing is, what is the greater impact? Um, and is it worth it? Um, or, or are we doing more harm than good if we scale these, these methods up? But I will say that, um, that that for for those for people who are who are buying in compost you know i'm i've i've said a lot about about you know the questions to ask potentially the things to avoid and one of the things to consider is when you're buying in compost um leaves are a wonderful thing to compost and we as a business we 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 accept leaf litter but we accept it in a very, very, very limited context. And we only do it when we have personal interactions with the people who are presenting that material to us. We're very careful about it. And the reason is, first of all, historically leaves have been, especially from, well, particularly from urban areas, they tend to contain polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which as the name implies are polycyclic. They, they, some of these hydrocarbons like persistent herbicides, they will persist through multiple metabolic cycles. So they can go through a composting cycle and still do damage to a person's garden or farm soil um, when they're applied. Um, so that's something that we've always been reluctant to take. Like we don't accept leaves at a large scale. And that's the reason um, that's, that's worked to our benefit in that because we're highly selective with accepting a feedstock like that. And it's at a very, very, very limited and a very like personal scale. Um, that's kind of protected us from, you know, the inclusions of snake worms, which of course they're, you know, they produce egg casings in the late summer, early autumn, they slough them off, the worms themselves die, the eggs persist, they can survive through, you know, incredibly cold temperatures. And, um, and then they can, uh, and they can gestate and then germinate the next year, and they're going to be found in that leaf litter layer. That's where you're going to be finding in the, in the absolute O horizon of that soil. That's where they're going to be found. So, you know, I will say that that another question for composters when you're making a selection um, is, you know, what are your, you know, what kind of rules do you have around accepting things like, you know, mulch, for instance, and accepting, um, you know, spent plants from nurseries. Um, you know, uh, because there are a lot of nurseries that unfortunately have snake worms and can contribute them to a compost facility. And then again, uh, leaf litter. And what are your rules on accepting or excluding leaf litter? Um, so that is, that is, that is something that, that a farmer, a gardener, an in-use consumer is going to want to explore that and, and really understand that and how they handle those feedstocks. Um, when they come into a compost facility, they break down in the thermophilic process. Yes, those eggs are destroyed, but should anything survive? So for instance, if the compost is being made in the summer and you have live worms coming in, um, in let's say like nursery pots, 
if they hit a hot compost pile and they're able to get away, or if the ground under that is not compact enough that they're able to um, that they're able to to slightly burrow, then you know they may persist, and at that point they they may be able to start to create populations in that area that then infest compost piles and ultimately are found in and disseminated by compost. Um, so that is something to be to be very careful about, you know, but part of that too is, you know, a compost facility that's doing their work on a concrete pad or um, natural soil that's been treated with some type of crushed stone in order to make it slightly impervious um, that has that has a decent offset from wooded areas. So it's not too close to a forest where, you know, um, a snakeworm population could actually migrate into finishing to cooler finishing compost piles and proliferate there. Um, those places, I'm not going to say that they're immune to infestations, but I will say that that they, you know, they're they're more resistant, you might say. So I'm wondering if there's any other questions about any of that. I'm not seeing anything in the chat, but if anyone wants to ask any questions, now would be a good time to unmute yourself and ask. I can ask a question. Yeah. Hi, I'm uh, in Quebec, so I'm not too far from you guys. I'm actually uh, nine kilometers, so I guess four miles from the border of Vermont. Yeah. Um, I wanted to know if you had like, um, have you, ha have you created curriculums or do you offer courses and uh because there's definitely there are definitely specialists here there's lots of people who love to grow mushrooms here there are people who are definitely um knowledgeable but often they're in the optic of a business and so they're often just busy like all farmers or people who are selling stuff like this um just struggling to make sure that they can make some money in it and so often all of the educational part is um missing and i have um I'm a seed farmer, um, but I've also sort of split my business now into two where I have, I'm moving towards like a bulk production and then the other half is, an, is a not-for-profit uh, sort of educational space. And this year we got a, a grant for um, uh, sort of creating and enhancing the soil life with um, compost extractions through a business that makes their own compost and it's, it's a really good compost. And, and I'm, I'm working with them to sort of create content to be able to, to help people understand this better. And so my question would be, do, do you do that? Is there online content? Can we buy content? Can you do, do like, is there, yeah, I guess that's, that's <laughs> what I want to know. Yeah, no, no, I, I think, I think that's, I think that's an excellent question. Um, and I think it, I, you know, it's interesting because it speaks to a niche and that's like, when you talk about you know, you know, you're, you've split your business and there's this not-for-profit component, um, this educational component. I think that, you know, like for Vermont Compost, for instance, as a business, we have been focused on, you know, value-adding compost and selling it as a potting media. We're proud of what we do and we love what we do, but we recognize that, you know, that, that establishing best practices and then, you know, teaching those practices is, is a, there's an incredible need for that. And, you know, as such, I think that something that I personally, like I want to explore is actually, is actually developing that educational side. Um, I don't know if we, as, as a business, we don't generate that kind of content and I'm trying to think, yeah, it's, you know, it's interesting. It's like, we really, everyone in this industry would benefit from having like a sort of clearing house for that kind of information. Right. Like right now it's like, I'm presenting this, but I'm sort of doing that at my own volition. Like I, when, when it was asked what, what I was going to talk about, I kind of wanted to talk about this because I like a challenge. <laughs> it's, 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 it's also, this is the unpleasant stuff to talk about, as I said in the beginning. Um, and I feel like it's really important to address the elephant in the room. And I think it also, it kind of, there are there are a lot of there are a lot of like glimmers of hope when we talk about these things and so i think that that that, that discussing it it kind of it 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 deflates a little bit of the fear 
um, because we're not like we're not all kind of like hiding from it in our own corners. We're like we're openly talking about it and we're sharing information. And we're in that way, we're going to develop with our communication. I believe we will develop solutions. I think that's all the that's the way society has like always worked. And that's to our benefit. But I think that what you're saying speaks to a real need, which is this, you know, yeah, like educational content and sort of like, uh, you know, you know, you know, a centralized, like a compendium of information around all of this. Um, and honestly, that's, you know, I mean, I prepared this talk for this for this conference, but when I really think about it, because of all the emerging um, research, that's that's really that's its own job right there. You know, so it's something I think about, like, what would it take to get to a place where, you know, I'm potentially trying to start a nonprofit that does exactly what you're saying, because I think you're right. I think there's a real need. And um, I'm sorry that I, I can't. I wish that I could direct you the one place that I that I could recommend um, and it's been pretty instrumental in some of this, particularly when we talk about like fungally dominant composts are. Um, Dr. Elaine Ingham, formerly of, I want to say, Oregon State University, had, of course, started the Soil Food Web School, and they've been really instrumental in really promoting and pushing for this, this fungally dominant compost um, concept. And I'm sort of taking it and running with it because, again, there's a lot of evidence that that's kind of our greatest hope for, you know, at, at this scale for doing some of this remediation work. Um, but I think that although she's not specifically talking about that, she her work has definitely has definitely leaned in that direction and i think that's that's a good place to start there's a lot of good links there that will um that that connect to other resources and have a lot of information so and it sounds like maybe you know maybe you're already you're already hip to some of that and you you know and you're already working along those lines i think i think she's an example of someone who's done a really good job of creating um sort of like an educational infrastructure for this and but i think there is more need so thank you. I agree. I think uh I think we're we're at that point because compost it's been about five, ten, five, about ten years actually. My kids are four, 14, so almost 15 years now that we've been talking about it here, at least due to the permaculture convergence that we had in Frelixburg, and and it's becoming more and more and more sort of normal it's even sort of spilling into uh, uh we have ag agronomic consultations that are mandatory if you have an organic farm and mm -hmm. even the the agronomic scientists are starting to be like less defensive you know i have like my agronomist she's like well all soil is living and it's like well we're not saying that all soil isn't living what we're saying is it could probably live better you know if you're if you're a whole family stuck in a in a one and a half apartment well wouldn't it be better if every if there was space to grow or or have more people come to have different meals or whatever just to use a, a off of the top of my head analogy so I think that we're at this point where it's evolving and we're every people are way more open to the concept of of the different that the, the life in your in your soil is similar to the life in your intestines is similar to life in your family and that all of these communities have to be healthy if they're going to thrive so i think it's just um the beginning of a, a long a long process that i'm going into because i just incorporated it as a nonprofit. um but it's just like to sort of put it out there that i all i'm i really do want to take a scientific approach to this um i like to do popular education but at the same time have very very specific and and science based learning through this nonprofit. So it's it's um it's uh it's just like a, I'm planting a seed. That's all I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, no, I appreciate you doing that. And I would say that one of the things, like when I was preparing this talk, one of the fears that I had, you know, it's like there's I don't I don't have anything conclusive to offer. I can't say like, well, I built this compost pile and I eliminated PFAS and like, look, I did it. Here's how you do it, right? And I think that that's one thing that kind of holds it back is that we don't, you know, we get afraid that like we don't have the solution and like maybe we're waiting for someone to give that to us. But it's going to be, you know, it's I was talking about diversity in soil. And I think that right now, one of the other things that gives me hope is like we look around and we see that in that, that in our societies right now, there's like a really big push um, to support diversity, to honor it and to kind of like right the wrongs of the past. And the great thing about that is like that word diversity, it's like we're starting 
we're starting, I mean, collectively, we're starting to realize how important that is on every level and that life really depends on that. Um, and I, 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 I think that that's something that I, I have hope there too, because with diversity comes better communication with better communication. It's like, we start bouncing these things off of each other. And suddenly like we do start to discover solutions and we start to like disseminate those solutions. So I think that there's a lot of hope despite, you know, <laughs> the, all of the challenges that we have. And I think it's wonderful that, you know, like for you to go in that direction is really important. And I'm glad that you had the wherewithal to like, to, you know, to strike off in that direction. Cause I think that you're right. That's absolutely critical, especially when we're talking about, like, I know some people here in Vermont who, um, you know, who, who really educated themselves on compost and soil science. And then the direction they wanted to go with it was they wanted to start teaching school kids. They wanted to start talking at schools and that's the majority of what they do, you know, for their, for their livelihood. And that's like, that's so, so, so important. So yeah, yeah, exactly. Love and hope, you know, so Hey, I have a quick um, question, comment. Um, I, um, I'm i working in, I guess, popular education, right? So I'm working on the very local community level, building community gardens, educating people for the first time on what is growing food, how is growing food. And so we're, we're learning for the first time about compost a lot of the time, and, and we're not at quite, quite this deep a level. Um, but, but there's a lot of practical knowledge in here and and so I guess my question is um on the layman level on the individual gardener level or the community gardener level working in urban suburban areas um in those kinds of soils and with those kinds of materials what are some some tips or some thoughts or some you know, choices and, and things that they can make and they can do at their level uh, to work with these issues. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, I mean, that's the, that's like the, that's like the all important question, really. Um, Cause yeah, it comes down to like, what's practical, you know, what's actionable. Um, I, I guess in if do you mind if I ask you a couple follow-up questions just to kind of like understand a little better? Oh, please do. Yeah, absolutely. Are you are are these mostly projects where 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 so you're educating children? Are they mostly projects where they're being taught about composting or gardening or both? Um, so I'm actually educating uh, all ages. I I run uh, farm and garden programs at a food bank in Long Island. Um, and so we're we're doing it all <clears throat> ages and all ability levels. Um, we're we're doing introductory food. It's it's food gardening basics, um, but then not everybody is at an introductory level, right? We're doing a lot of support at people that are working at higher levels and that are, you know, so so composting is that next step, you know, that's step two that we take them into, right? So step one is we teach them about, about food growing and step two, you know, then we start to take deeper steps into, you know, maybe seed saving or maybe composting, right? Um, and so, so we have, New York City has its own organics collection programs here um, that, that uh, sug publicly suggest using plastics in, you know, putting your compost in a plastic bag so it's easier to collect. Yeah. You know, so there's, you know, clear advocacy work that we can do there at that level. Um, and, and that's stuff people ask me about, you know, constantly when they're asking, you know, they get interested in gardening and then they say, oh, well, you know, how can I start, you know, collecting my food scraps and how can I start? One of the things I, I often suggest to people is to use recycled cardboard and pizza boxes in, you know, mulching and weed barriers um, in the gardens, you know, to sort of prevent plastics use. But, um, you know, I, I, there, you said there's PFAS in, in, you know, pizza boxes and stuff like that. So I'd love to know, 
you know, just any little, little layman's household things like that, you know, should I not recommend that anymore? Um, things like that. Are there any things like that you have in mind? Yeah, the cardboard box one is kind of tough. Well, so, so, so just to consider, so, um, so to, to get really practical then, so I can't with card with pizza boxes, it's hard for me to say like, which manufacturers use PIFA compounds and which don't that's like a, right. it's a generalization, but I know, mm -hmm. and that's the hard part about all of this. And there's no like mm -hmm. mandated reporting either. It's not like they have to show a list of ingredients. Right. Um, so pizza boxes are one that I would just to be safe. I would, unfortunately, I would probably shy away from, although when I say pizza boxes, what I'm talking about really are like, when you think about, you know, I'm not thinking of like your typical, just brown cardboard. It's more like if you get the white glossy. Yeah. So I, yeah. So one of the tips I always tell people, you know, is, is shy away from any colored uh, inks or glossy finishes or anything like that. Stick to brown cardboard, brown paper. Um, you know, is, is that a pretty safe yeah. advice yeah, yeah, yeah. for the yeah, layperson? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, um, yeah, you know, are there things that you do in your personal life that this knowledge has informed, you know, when you're doing your personal, you know, home scrap composting or, or I don't know if you do any home gardening or whatever. <laughs> um, but, you know, are there any things like that that you, oh, this information informs your, your behaviors on that level? Um, yeah, yeah, I would say, I would say that it definitely does. Um, I would say that there are certain things that, that I try to avoid, you know, as far as like, like certain types of food packaging. Um, so, you know, I'm thinking about like plastics that are used to hold, or so like, like the single serve salad dressings, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm, and like mm -hmm. plastics like that. That's something that I generally just am going to try to avoid. I mean, partially because of the yeah. plastic and partially because likely it, they're using PFAS in there most likely. Um, so I would say that that's one thing I do. And then, you know, I can speak, I, I, I will shamefully admit that most of my compost goes to work because it can be readily composted there. I admit it. Um, and you know, and, and so like as a business that we, one of the things that we do is we generally don't bring in food from third-party haulers. We tend to be bringing in, we've created our own hauling service basically. And we're like, you know, picking and choosing um, where we, where we bring food in from. And that has a lot to do with, with plastic inclusion. That's something that as a business, we were on top of that was like a big concern for us like 15 years ago when it was just not even on the radar um, for a lot of people at that point, you know, there wasn't really a lot of talk about like plastic in the oceans. I mean, it just wasn't, it just wasn't, it was like a fringe topic really. Um, and so we've always been kind of on that. That's always been something that we, you know, that, that we focused on and fortunately we were, we were lucky enough that we were able to set ourselves up to, to bring food in on our own. And of course that's there, there's more labor costs and infrastructure costs there, but, but, you know, but for good reason and to good effect. Um, so I would say in my own life, yeah, being careful about, about what I, what types of plastics I use, trying to reduce plastic as much as I can, trying to reuse as much as I can. Um, and, and then definitely as far as business goes, you know, being, being really careful about what we accept and what we don't being selective. And then to, to speak, you know, to go back to the educational part, I think, yeah, it's tough because especially in an urban environment, you have these people who are there like budding and opening up and they're interested in this. And the last thing that we want to do is slam them with all of these fears and like, well, don't do this and don't do that. And don't, you know, um, because we really could, you know, we really could drive them away before they've even really come into the fold, so to speak, right? So I think that, so I think that, so I think that, that, that promoting, you know, I mean, obviously like the major do's and don'ts, like don't use glossy paper with colored inks, right? Like, that's great. Um, you know, try to, you know, make sure that you don't throw your, your, you know, the comp, you know, like 
explaining to someone why compostable plastic wear is not really actually compostable. <laughs> yeah. That, yeah, that's the one that's like, that's definitely worth the conversation up front. Um, and, you know, it, and I, so, so I think like that's a place where, you, you know, you're going to want to talk and you're going to want to focus. I think it's almost like the most egregious things that we face, you, you definitely want to address head on. And then the other stuff you kind of want to like really promote that concept of diversity, you know, especially diversity of species in compost mm -hmm. and in garden soils and teaching techniques that, that foster that and that increase that and support it. And I think that as people get more advanced and they master that kind of stuff, then, then I think it's time to really talk about like these, these, these up and coming um, issues you know, and, and to kind of get into it just so they're not like overloaded on the front end. Um, but again, getting the compostable plastic wear out of the food stream is going to be, that's going to be a thing in and of itself. One of the challenges that we have faced is, you know, because we're not using a depackaging machine, we don't have to worry about shredded plastic for the most part, although we do have some commercial facilities that we take food from that like, they have staff that, you know, are they're used to using a garbage disposal and they'll put things down the garbage disposal. Sometimes they put plastic things. And these are like industrial scale garbage disposals that will chop up compostable plastic ware. And like, suddenly that's in your food stream. And that's something that we, you know, we're blessed because, and, and I know that this is not a one size fits all solution, but we're blessed because we're in this smaller community. Um, like I said, our, the city of Montpelier is really a town. It's not really a city especially when you compare it to like any of the boroughs in New York. But, you know, because of that, we're able to have these relationships with people with like where we can walk right into the facility and be like, hey, so it looks like this, you know, maybe you maybe you put some plastic into the garbage disposal. Can you not do that? You know, it's like so we're able to do that. I think, though, that that's one of those things where it's going to come down to communication and like, you know, having those relationships. And that's the one benefit of working at the grassroots is that you're more likely to have the relationship with the people from whom you're receiving food residuals, for instance, and you have a better chance of like communicating with them, making eye contact and saying like this, you know, this is why we don't want to do this. Can you please, you know, um, I know, I'm sorry if that doesn't, that's not like the perfect answer, but I kind of think that's the best answer I can give at the moment, you know? No, that, that's incredibly helpful. I think that, you know, your point on strength and diversity has been uh, a really strong running theme in, in your presentation. And I'm, I'm really grateful for that because that's something that we teach a lot in plant production, um, but but you're making such great points about, about fungal and, and bacterial diversity um, and their remedial properties. Um, you know, that translates on the, on the individual level. So I, I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. No, you're welcome. And, and if I can just say like that, when I think about that diversity in, in the context of human society, it's like, especially for someone who's doing the work you're doing in an urban environment, it's like, we don't, we don't want to, you know, we don't want this to be exclusive. We don't want it to be like, well, you know, depending on your class, your creed, the color of your skin, you get to eat organic food or food you grew yourself and everybody else is kind of consigned to the food desert, you know? So we really, it's like, we want cultural diversity and we want everyone, you know, to, to, to weave this beautiful multicolored tapestry from all of these different threads, but we really would like it if like everybody had an education around soil health. I mean, people have an idea of like, I should be getting exercise. I should be doing these things that take care of my body. Like that's something that we, most public schools teach that right with physical education, and I think that like rudimentary soil health education is something that should be taught because it's like, that is the ground of life. And then we feed it and it feeds us. And it's this, you know, it's this reciprocal cycle. that's like, it's so important. And I don't think that that should be restricted. Like everyone should have that education and that basic understanding. And I think that if we did, and if we, I'll say, okay, I'm sorry, I'll be optimistic. If we do, when we do, um, then talking about these kinds of, it, it's like, there's going to be more, there's going to be that, 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 that grassroots lobbying pressure too on state and federal um, legislators to like, 
to like to, to to push back against you know some of these like convenient contaminants that that industrial society creates because they really help with the bottom line and then when we all have that education and we're all thinking along those lines and it all matters to us it's more a part of our like our our thoughts and our dialogue i think too that's where um it it you know it's like this idea of like single use packaging is suddenly becomes more abhorrent people are like well wait a minute why are we doing this this doesn't you know right now if you grow up that way that's just the way the world is right like you don't i mean how would you know differently there you know so i think that the work you're doing especially in that setting is really important thank you for doing it and yeah i think like promoting that diversity and maybe even promoting it as a way that's like, Hey, you know, like we want a diverse society and the soil works the same way. It's all about diversity because everybody has a different job to do. And when they all do their jobs together, they all feed and support each other. And we produce these beautiful plants. Now, I won't say effortlessly, but with a lot less effort, you know? Okay. I hate to cut off this conversation, but we are over on time. I know. I'm so, sorry. No, that's okay. This has been very informative. I think everyone has really enjoyed it. Um, so if anyone wants to continue it, there is kind of a message board in the conference area where questions can be asked and answered. Um, there is a link in the chat to a uh, an evaluation on the a survey. So if anyone wants to fill that out, uh, we really appreciate it. Um, thank you all for attending. I'm sorry if anyone had questions we couldn't get to, but uh, we really need to, to stop this workshop. So thank you so much, Jay, for your time and all the information. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for having me. And thank you for everyone who brought questions and attended. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thanks to all.